This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 169, recorded on February 3rd, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today for an unprecedented four weeks in a row, right here in studio, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Dixon, you feeling all right? Three, four great. weeks in a row? I feel great. Why are you no. in TWIV so many times? I feel like I'm a re- I've rejoined the human race by coming back to TWIV. Just like the old days. <laughs> exactly. Let's see. So there was last week. Yep. There was the week before. Yep. There was the week before that. Yep. And the week before that. And my guess is I'll be there the week and after that's this. It. That's it. 165, yeah. Yeah. 66, 67, 68. This is the fifth in a row. I hope that you realize that I would be here all the time if I could. I don't realize that. No, please do. I mean, I'm, I'm pulled away every now and then, but yeah. I, I, my heart is with Twiv. Things are tugging at your strings. They are. Strings. Okay. <laughs> Good to see you, Dixon. Same here, Vincent. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. The master of epistasis. (laughs) Is that correct or is that an improper? Well, I I guess I would have to write that down with an epi pen. (laughs) But we'll explain that in a moment. Ooh. (laughs) How is everything, Alan Dove? Things are good. Okay. And the weather is sunny, blue skies, right? Yes, like yes. clear blue skies and uh, feels like spring. Tell me about that. This is, this is a little troublesome, don't you think? This morning it was negative 7.5 centigrade, you know. Yeah, but yesterday it was 60 degrees. But not last night. No. When I left the New York Academy at, I don't know, 10 p.m., it was yeah. pretty cold. That's right. Yeah, I heard you got in a fight. Yeah, we'll talk <laughs> about that. He's, you should see the other guys. <laughs> it's currently 5 degrees in New York. Yeah. Also joining us today from... North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, fellas. How's it going? Rich, great. I know it's 26 degrees in Gainesville. Look at that. Oh, my God. Is that right? What is that? What is that in Fahrenheit? My little thing thing says 78 degrees. Short sleeve weather. Wow. That's really intense. Yeah, you know, I have this thing. This may be what uh, Dixon was alluding to. You can't even feel good about good weather anymore, okay? (laughs) Because it's uh, it it makes me feel like there's global warming going on, and I got to feel bad about that. What's up with What's up with this? We're not making you feel bad. I can feel okay. Yeah, we would actually we would go there if we could. (laughs) Exactly. Okay. Global warming is a much longer time scale. Last winter, we had an absolutely horrible winter. This is still true. These are yeah, just we had was cold here last winter, too, yeah. These are perfect. Okay, great. I'm, 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 I feel better now. Good. That That's was good. easy. You're a cheap one. <laughs> yeah, I'm easy. He doesn't need 40 years of psychoanalysis to fix him. <laughs> <laughs> we have a special guest today from not too far from us, from uh, the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics in the School of Public Health at the State University of New York, downstate in Brooklyn, Michael Walsh, welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And uh, it is also nice here. A little colder because it's always a little edgier in Brooklyn. Edgier. <laughs> uh, this is true. But you know what, Rich? You, you actually should feel good about the weather that you're experiencing and feel bad about climate change because I was – in Austra- <laughs> I, was, I was in Australia over the the holidays, oh. and it's their summer there, yeah. and it was terribly cold. It was unseasonably really? cold, having very strange uh, weather, and it's really been like that through their whole be uh, summer. So, mm. wow, uh, they are they are having strange weather as well. So well, last year they had fires and floods, and this year yeah, they're having cold yeah. weather. What yeah. part of Australia, Michael? The problem with climate change is as it changes, you don't get. A predictable That's uniform exactly. warming the deal. that would be easier to adapt to. What, what exactly. part of Australia were you, where were you in? Uh, this was in uh, New South Wales and Sydney. My wife is she grew up in Sydney. Ah, so we go back every couple of years. Got it. Oh, that's too bad. 
Yeah, it's sensational. <laughs> this is a place I've never been that I would really like to go. Oh, Richard. Oh, it's it. absolutely fantastic. I spent six months on sabbatical in Melbourne. So, uh, oh, had a good, great city. Good time. It was great a wonderful city. city. But again, an abnormal year even while I was down there. And that was 1986. Huh. Uh, they had uh, bizarre weather patterns. Well, you know, the other thing about being in Australia is you don't re- – the, the ozone is, is more depleted there. Yeah. And you don't recognize how intense the sun is, this is true. until you've been out in it for 10, 15 minutes, and that's enough to do you in. Yep. I, I had a, a, a bad burn just from standing outside for a little bit, and uh, it really creeps up on you. Yeah. Michael, where are you from originally? I grew up in Chicago. And you have a PhD, right? Where'd you get that? Uh, University of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Oh, that's a great place. Yes. What, what's the PhD in? Epidemiology. Epidemi- wow. Yeah. About that. And where'd you go to college? I went to Marquette. Ah. And actually, it was while I was a student at Marquette that the epidemiological epiphany hit me. Mm-hmm. This is what I wanted to do. Why was that? Uh, what hit? What, uh, well, made it actually, that? at the time, uh, Marquette had a unique program, and uh, they had a department called biomedical sciences. And I had a, a double major in biomedical sciences and biological anthropology. So it's sort of, you know, like human evolution. Um, <clears throat> and I was taking a course on uh, sexual selection, I believe it was. And for whatever reason, I don't really remember what the topic was. Uh, viral epidemiology was the topic or one of the topics uh, for discussion that day. And it just hit, th- I immediately hit me like a ton of bricks. This is what I want to do. Mm. Um, so it was it was a unique program in that uh, there used to be a medical school at Marquette. It's now the Medical College of Wisconsin. Very good school. They kept the dental school, but the medical school uh, branched off. So now they have uh, dental students and um, their PT students, physical therapy students, who take all of the you know their first two years of coursework is pretty much the same as the the medical students and. If you are a biomedical sciences major, you take all these courses with them. So I had the fortunate opportunity to take the equivalent uh, equivalents of uh, medical student courses at the undergrad level with all of the gross anatomy and pathology and um, pathophys and histology and all. And it was just a fantastic uh, educational experience. I, it's one, one of the great highlights of... Uh, of I think my life so far was the education I got at Marquette it was really good. So so you um, you get a PhD in epidemiology. So I guess you do epidemiological research, right? Mm-hmm. As part of that, and what right. did you do? So well, that's a li- <laughs> it's a little bit convoluted. So okay, I graduated from undergrad, and I didn't quite know the context in which I wanted to do epidemiology, whether I wanted to work in academia or in government or, you know, where I wanted to be. So I applied to a job in India. I actually spent uh, five years on and off working in India. Um, And the first year that I was there was in 97. It was a year and a half after I graduated from undergrad. And I worked on a tuberculosis elimination project. Um, So we did DOTS therapy, directly observed uh, therapy, short course. Uh, we did, I, I built a surveillance program uh, for part of the component of the TB elimination project that I was working on. Who's running this? This was uh, a, an NGO uh, that was working in collaboration with the state government of Karnataka, which is the state that I Karnataka. was working in. Was that a Catholic okay. Relief Service sponsored thing by any chance? Was it uh, which Catholic Relief Service? By no, it was it was known as uh, the Karuna Trust was the uh-huh. foundation, and the local there was a local clinic called the uh, VGKK uh, clinic, which did most of the operations type stuff. Um, <clears throat> so I worked on that for about a year, and on, then I uh, sort of transitioned into a new project uh, called Swastia, which was a a, a women's health Major, the major focus was women's health, but my contribution was in the area of HPV and cervical cancer uh, screening uh, and, and, and doing some intervention work there. And we also did some projects on 
uh, general STI uh, barriers to to things like negotiating condom use and, and stuff like that. Um, so at any rate, my PhD was, uh, I actually didn't start out at Pittsburgh. I started out at University of Illinois, Chicago. So and you did all that stuff at India and you said somehow you made a decision, I want to do a PhD? Yes, yes. So that was, it was, uh, the, I did a lot of uh, surveillance type, uh, what would be government implement, implementation type work with the TB. Work. And, I, you know, I loved it. It was, uh, it was uh, an incredible experience. I got a lot of, I learned a lot of course. And, um, you know, it was, it was great work, but when I then went on to do the HPV cervical cancer stuff, um, it just seemed that the, 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 the pathway to academia seemed to make more sense. Okay. So, so the, so I was going to be looking at, uh, circumcision status and, uh, and high, uh, the high risk HPV types. So 16 and 18, and the occurrence of uh, cervical cancer in women in India. And I was, it was great. I, I was working with an institution called Kidwai, Kidwai Cancer Institute in Bangalore. And they approved my proposal and, and uh, their IRB passed it. And we had all the clinicians set up and ready to go. And then I came back in August of, uh, I think it, I want to say August of two thousand or 99 august of 99 and um what had happened at uic was uh the feds had come in and shut down all human research because of major irb violations in the department of psychology so even though it was just within the, the context of the psychology research groups all human res all human subjects research at the the whole university was shut down indefinitely while the, and this was major national news you may have uh come across this across, across this at some point so anyway so here i was i had all of the pegs lined up in india i was ready to go i was ready to go back the following may and begin the work and i couldn't because i needed to get my own irb approval through uic um and they were estimating that the wait could be up to two to two and a half years and it ended up being two years before everything was completely normalized. But the, everybody, you know, there were people who were waiting on me in, back in India, and they couldn't wait. So it was a really horrible time. <laughs> and I had to decide what I wanted to do, you know, with the rest of my life. I mean, because they couldn't wait indefinitely in Bangalore. And, um, you know, the clock was ticking. And I didn't, at that point, I didn't know what was going to happen at UIC. Um, so what I did was a complete shift. I mean, it doesn't get any more complete than this. So I was uh, also working as a research assistant in uh, type 1 diabetes. Okay, This was just sort of paying the bills uh, while I was at UIC. Now, I was working on a, a global multinational uh, study of type 1 diabetes and its complications. When it looked like I was at a dead end with uh, the cervical cancer, the HPV cervical cancer research. I applied to the University of Pittsburgh, which was the he the the, uh, the PI for this study, uh, was located, and they they accepted me right away. And so I went on to do my PhD in type one diabetes and its complications. <laughs> wow! <laughs> in uh, well, I mean that the that was the subject of my uh, research, but it was. Uh, Epidemiology methods is is sort of you know that's the whole process along you know whether you're doing uh, cervical cancer and I and I do have to make a case for generalism in epidemiology. I mean there's a there's this tendency there has been over the last uh, 15 20 years of every, anyone being an epidemiologist having to specialize in uh, in one area of research and while I think there is certain value in that. Um, there's also a need for, for generalists, um, to who, and, th and those generalists need to be the methodologists. They need to be the ones who are developing methodology as well as holding everyone else to account, I think. Um, so anyway, uh, did the PhD at Pittsburgh. Uh, then I moved to New York and, uh, started, I took a job with the Department of Health where I worked on some surveillance projects, uh, 
For so a, does that, one does one not typically do a postdoc with a PhD in epidemiology? No, one actually does typically do a postdoc, and and this is the equivalent to my postdoc. The the okay. work that I do uh, is, you know, a lot of people will actually do that in, as a uh, as a, as their postdoc. They will go and work in uh, a government office. It can be okay. you know a local um, health department, as was the case for me, or the CDC. The CDC has a lot of uh, fellowships and internships and postdocs. Um, the EIS is probably the, the most famously known, the, the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Um, so Wait, what, I, what, what I year was the, that? The, what year was that when you joined the New York Department of Health? S- sorry, say that again? What year did you join the New that York Department of Health? That was in 2003. 2003, okay. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was the end of 2003, beginning of 2004. Right. So um, I... Uh, took I was I was there for a year, and then uh, a position came up for uh, an epidemiologist at NY is do, working on nosocomial infection uh, at uh, the Hospital for Joint Diseases, which is at NYU. And so I had a dual appointment there in uh, faculty position in the Department of Environmental Medicine, uh, which has two divisions: one epidemiology, one biostats, and then the other one, the other. Uh, position was in the orthopedics department because I was basically a nosocomial infection epidemiologist at the at the hospital, and I did that for six and a half years. I was there for six and a half years and uh, did a lot of very interesting work. Um, you know, surgical site wound infections are a big problem, uh, particularly as we age and and need to have more procedures. Uh, so you know. Keep and you know, especially in the face of antimicrobial resistance, uh, nosocomial infection is a huge, huge problem in this country and actually everywhere in the world. It's it's very serious. Uh, and I also sick. got to dabble in uh, in one of my sort of hobbies, which is mechanics. I love physics and I love biomechanics, so I got really? to oh, yeah. actually consult and do a lot of work with um, uh, some biomechanical. Uh, projects there and, and published a uh, bunch of papers on that. So that was, I loved that. That was interesting. Did you find also, a difference oh, in sorry. nosocomial infections between the metal on metal versus metal on Teflon joint replacements? Yeah, so this is a big, huge area yeah, of research yeah, now yeah. looking at uh, the metal, like you say. So the joints, you, you basically, what happens when you have, say, for example, a hip replacement, you cut out the proximal and the top of the femur bone and uh, a lot of times, you, well, you, you insert a uh, prosthetic uh, into the bone, okay, and this serves then as the new replaced proximal end of the femur, and this then uh, articulates or, or contacts with the uh, the uh, ball and socket of the, the pelvis, okay, and the question is, what is that material? So there's me- the metal on metal, there's uh, ceramic, there's metal plastic there's all kinds of configurations and the uh, the it, it seems to be that certain configurations uh are more associated with nosocomial infection deep infection uh than other ones so ceramic looks to be the best uh if if anyone's in uh in the market for a hip- Hip replacement. <laughs> it's remarkable. The chairman of our department, uh, Harry Ginsburg, uh, was a former University of Michigan football player. And really? <laughs> back in the old days when they didn't have anything to protect themselves with except right. a piece of steak for a helmet. So, right. so, <laughs> so then he, he obviously retired. But in the meantime, he, he was in the uh, market for a hip replacement. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, he didn't get his hip replaced here. He went someplace else. Mm. And when they did it, he got an intercard infection, and uh, he had to come back here and get the whole thing done again. Yeah, well, that's the problem. When you have a deep infection, yeah. you have to have another replacement. That's right. So it's a it's a big deal. And yep. it's, it's a big deal for the patient, their family, who you know yeah. they're yeah. with them recuperating, as well as the cost. It's a huge cost. Sure it is. So yeah, it's a big problem, unfortunately. Yep. So did they ever resolve which was the best to use to avoid this? Well, orthopedic surgeons don't really resolve things. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I asked the question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I just Which want our listeners end, to know what was going on. I, I decided to let, I, you know, by the first two years were very, I mean, all my years there were very productive. But um, by the last few years, and then particularly right when my daughter was born, I was not 
in a happy situation, I would say. I think um, that there, it's, it can be difficult to, uh, you know, I, I worked with a lot of the orthopedic surgeons and it's a very different culture. Um, and I, I decided when my, when my daughter was born that uh, I needed, I, I couldn't be going into a place every day that was uh, not a happy place to be. So that's when I started to look uh, for uh, faculty positions elsewhere and I came across this and it's been uh, fantastic. I've been here for um, going into my third year uh, and I've, I, I don't do much nosocomial infection stuff anymore. I'm back into my uh, first love, which is um, uh, infection, well, infection and uh, disease ecology and, and the context of the broader landscape, uh, social and physical, for, for human infections. So that's something you decided to do when you went to Brooklyn because you hadn't done that for many years, right? Correct. Correct. That was one of the – so one, I wanted to be in a situation where – uh, the colleagues, the, my future colleagues, people who I who I met through interviewing, uh, impressed upon me that you know it was a, a a good collegial place to be, where we can be critical, but yet you know in a constructive way. Uh, and then the second thing was I wanted to come back to uh, infectious disease and and be able to to work and have the freedom to work on the the stuff that I wanted to work on. Yeah. So according to your webpage, you work on parasitic diseases? I work, so I have two things going on now. One is uh, West Nile virus mm -hmm. um, and uh, different uh, landscape factors that are involved in West Nile virus. And the other one is, uh, I'm looking at Toxicara infections. Are you? And Yeah, well, we're beginning the, our, our pilot program this spring. Excellent. So we're going to be cr creating a map of New York City oh, that's great. and doing uh, a uh, structured sampling yeah. of soil and dog feces from neighborhoods throughout uh, New York City. Do you get a lot of kids coming into your clinics with high use and affiliates of unexplained origin? Well, you know, not so much. Be but, you know, here's the thing. Here's what's very interesting to me. Um, we should have, we should have lunch a, there's sometime. A lot of, there's a lot of idiop – oh, yeah, it would be great. There's a lot of idiopathic – Asthma or right. asthma -like conditions. That's true. There you and go. so there the you go. extent to, and particularly in areas like um, uh, Harlem and uh, mm -hmm. uh, East uh, East Harlem, right, and Flatbush here, where you know uh, yeah. downstate is, and you know a certain extent of this asthma can be explained by you know pollution and uh, cigarette smoking in the home, pests even in the right. home. Right. Um, however, it doesn't seem to account for all of the asthma that's occurring in poor kids, mm. and you know. So this is the the the, the first study will be a sort of a uh, prevalence of toxicara eggs in the environment. Right. To be followed up by a a <laughs> oh, we, study of children in the same neighborhoods yeah. to see to measure first of all the the uh, the sero do serology on right. whether or not they exhibit antibodies yeah, yeah. to toxic car, and then secondarily to do lung function tests. I would you, highly encourage you to go to the dog runs. The dog <laughs> runs, yeah. Well, you know what's interesting about that? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I don't know if this is true or not, but would you not find more dog runs in, high, in more affluent neighborhoods than in poor neighborhoods? Uh, that sounds what, like that's a no. You know what? You could actually <laughs> – I bet you the city Department of Health has that map. Uh, uh, yeah. And well, or the Parks Department. Plug parks it department, into right? yeah. uh, the GIS devices, and, and I want to hook you up with somebody else over at Hunter, unless you know him already, Sean Ahern. Do you know I that? don't know him. No. Oh, he's, he's a West Nile virus uh, aficionado as well. Oh, okay. And does a lot of mapping and uh, is, a, is a big GIS person. And you guys need to talk to each other, so that would be great. Well, great. All three of us should have lunch sometime. That would be great. That'd yeah, be great. I'd love that. Dixon, we never did a Toxocara episode, did we? No, we didn't. Why, why is that? Because it's an aberrant nematode infection. We've aberrant. only done the non-aberrant nematode infections. Yeah. It's primarily a dog and cat. Exactly. Form. Exactly. We t we touched on we it in the asterisk because I know we talked about we dog did. runs. VLM and OLM. That's we've we've oh, done yeah, those Oh yeah, I remember that. That's right. But mm -hmm. but this and, is something even the, different the, uh, from that. Okay. The visceral complications and the ocular complications are pretty rare, but Correct. there may be an argument for 
uh, this worm, if there is an indication that, it, that there is prevalence uh, yeah. in the environment of the worm, its eggs, exactly. then there may be an argument for it contributing to asthma and asthma-like conditions in yep. ch- children. But, you know, we don't have data, so we need to get data. Peter Hotez is big on this aspect also. I don't know if you know that name or not. but he's Of course. A, okay, Peter you know. Hotez. Yeah. In fact, when I, I was at the uh, American Society of Tropical Medicine Hygiene, and I saw oh, his, yeah. Oh, yeah. his uh, talk, which was fantastic. He was on, the president. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So he and I are friends, so you should uh, yeah. contact him too. So when you talk about collecting data for this, mm-hmm. what do you have to do? So we're going to do so – the, for the Toxicara? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so we're going to do soil and feces uh, collection all across uh, New York. Now, what does that mean yeah. specifically? Soil you, I can understand. I don't know the feces part. <laughs> Yeah, so if you well, that's what soil you, is made out of. <laughs> it's well, if you walk around Washington Heights, exactly, you'll be able to see exactly. lots of it on the side. You slide slide around Washington that's Heights. What, that's please. what people cleaned up after their dogs. They were no. supposed to, but no, <laughs> not in a lot of neighborhoods. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. You know, it's been great that we haven't had a lot of snow yeah, because one of the, that's right. the the most awful New York experiences <laughs> is when the snow starts to melt. Yes, and there are little bombs, little you know, landmines waiting for you. <laughs> In the mush. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, I laugh, but you're absolutely right about yeah. that. Yeah. So you so, can walk around and collect stool from the street? Yes. Could. Yes. Just right. randomly. Sorry. No, not randomly. It's, it's, it's going to so be random. a sample. And the sample is going to be based on a grid. Uh, uh, okay. It's going to be a systematic sample Got you it. Know, because we can't you know, just walk all the streets. And <laughs> no, but you could do a transect. <laughs> you could do a transect, right? Yeah. Because yeah. the ecologists do that a lot. For these right. that so, to, so to take a sample, you'd take a, a block line. and you'd say you're going to you're going to walk around that block until you find some a uh, dog pile. Correct, correct, correct. And but it's it's going to be dog piles and soil because you know we're also going to need to rely on uh, soils. And there's you know you, you think of Manhattan, you think well there's no soil in Manhattan. Where's oh, there soil? Uh, but there actually is. I mean even right. on you know when you're outside of a park context. Sure. sure. Trees are everywhere, and that's, you know, dogs do their business at the trees. So uh, it'll be feces and soil samples. So this is through all the boroughs of uh, New York? or Well, the idea is to do all the boroughs. I mean, we're going to have to see how much money we have. And, uh, you know, manpower probably is not going to be a problem because there's medical and public health students abound right here. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Yeah, but you, someone you, has uh, to do it. And, and, they're, and they're used to shoveling up all of the uh, the BS that I that I deliver in, in class. So, um, are you yeah. going to go out yourself too? Absolutely. Absolutely. So how many people are you going to have walking around with? Well, right now I've got – for to start in the spring, I've got about uh, seven or eight. Um, so – and will you bring a little white uh, containers with you? Yep. I have to – yeah, yeah. Does so anyone ever ask you what you're doing? Well, it's going to stimulate some interesting conversations. <laughs> I'll say. Just tell them business is picking up. Yeah. <laughs> or in this case, you're picking up business. Right, exactly. <laughs> so then you, you go out every day for a certain amount of time. And then what do you do with these samples? You bring them back? See, that's the other thing. That's a great question. You said, uh, the, the, Let me just repeat that. So you go out for a certain amount of time every day. Now – the yes, you go out for a certain amount of time, but you can't always go out at the same times because people don't bring their dogs out all at the same times. So you actually have to stagger that. Um, you'll have to get some, uh, you know, morning uh, shifts and midday shifts and uh, evening shifts. Careful how you say the word. Shifts. Shifts. That's correct. That's correct. Shifts. Yes. We're having fun with this show, aren't we? It's a we? shitty job, but somebody has to <laughs> Oh, I knew somebody would say it. I knew somebody. <laughs> Is that an episode title? <laughs> Can we leave that in? We uh, could. I don't know. It Apple would make label. it explicit, yeah. Is, is that one of the seven words you can't say on mm-hmm. Twiv? But... <laughs> that is one of the seven words. <laughs> okay. So you go out at different times, you collect, right. and yeah. then what do you do with the stuff? So then bring it back and uh, spin it down to see if, in fact... Uh, there are Toxicara eggs. Are you going to float them? And, and Yeah, well, so I actually, Dixon, do you know um, Hasib Siddiqui? Uh, no. He's a fantastic helminthologist here. Um, Wish I did know him then. So he knows all of the uh, specific laboratory procedure, but right. yes, I believe the idea is yeah. you, you mix the, the uh, soil 
feces yep. uh, in solution, and then you spin it down, and then that's the eggs come float. to the float to the top. Right. That's right. That's, it's a sucrose yeah. solution that she uses. Uh, right. 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 Mm-hmm. So you just want to know eggs or no eggs? You're not exactly. Gonna, you're not going to count right. them or anything. That's the starting point. Yes. And exactly. that's it. And then we create a map, a, a prevalence map. Right. And <clears throat> then this map can be um, overlaid with. Uh, uh, what is currently known with respect to incidents of uh, asthma and asthma-like conditions. Exactly. Of course, this is correlation, not causation. So right, right. we can then use this data um, to try to get more funding, and then the subsequent funding will allow us to go in and actually do population-based surveying of the uh, the children in, in the neighborhood. So that means you're going to get them to give you a stool sample? We'll get stool samples, we'll get uh, uh, lung function, and we'll get serology. Right. Ah. So there's another uh, species, right, Taxicara cati. There's cati and cannabis. Which yeah. is in feral cats. How would you correct for that one? Well. Because people are not yeah. out there taking their cats out because they're already out. That's true. In fact, you know, that has come up with uh, the sandboxes. In, yes. Um, Yes. In the children's playgrounds, exactly, and how those can be risky, yep, risky areas for kids because of the cats coming and, yeah, and yeah. defecating. And I once had to write a review on this subject for clinical microbiological reviews, and uh, I I was not considered an expert at this, but they wanted me to write it anyway, so I did. And of course, when you review the literature and you go around the world and you see where this is found you realize that this is a huge urban problem. I mean, no matter where you go, the mm-hmm. number of feral animals and the am- mm-hmm. amount of feces that accumulates in the environment is just incredible. Yeah. And this, this could be a very serious uh, problem. I, I had the privilege of going to Bhutan once. Mm-hmm. Uh, we couldn't sleep at night for all the feral dogs that oh. were up barking. Really? Their, their, yeah, it was amazing. Well, you know, when I, the, the years that I spent in India, <laughs> the dogs, oh, you know, sure. they're a serious problem. You bet. I mean, there's a lot of rabies. That's exactly uh, right. It's a big, big, big problem. Sure. And they and form packs. You know, they, they, that's right. And they're very dangerous. You know? Indeed. It's not, uh, they're that's not to right. be toyed with. No, you got it. You're, you're, you're doing a remarkable job. That's, How long is this going to take, this initial survey? Uh, well, the goal is to have everything uh, collected and mapped by the winter season. You know, wow. by, by the, and, and do it in one season. Mm-hmm. Before so, those little snow piles. That came right. <laughs> so there's another confounding factor here, though, right, mm-hmm. uh, Michael? And that is the level of ozone any. that accumulates in the atmosphere during the summer months. And you look at hospital admits, mm-hmm. and you can actually, uh, with a map, mm-hmm. overlay the ozone layer uh, that develops along the ground with right. uh, uh, with admits. So how are you going to correct for that one? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, we have we can only partially – account for that. Mm-hmm. We can't fully account for that. Okay. Um, what we do have are some fantastic data uh, that the, the health department has compiled right. with respect to hyper-local mm-hmm. uh, pollution, you know, ozone and particulate right. matter. And, right, right. Um, I mean, we have very, very narrow corridors of pollution gradients. Um, so that is another layer of... Um, uh, feature that you know we can actually look at and try to get at controlling to a certain extent, but you know it's still ecologic in that it's one step up from the individual. You still cannot measure each individual's exposure to you know you can't quantify what their exposure is to um, dangerous, potentially asthma-causing um, uh, particulate matter and, and ozone in the atmosphere. So this. This may actually segue into your more general discussion of epidemiology, but you mentioned that you can, in these studies, uh, establish a correlation Mm -hmm. between uh, eggs in the feces and, say, asthma or whatever, but you can't, uh, that won't uh, show causation. That's correct. Can, Can you determine causation epidemiologically? No, it's not possible. Um, right. You know, that's a lot of people, including myself, don't necessarily understand that. Well, here's the thing. Uh, actually, I think there's a great place to start with that. Um, and, and let me just say from the outset, you know, I'm an epidemiologist, obviously, and, and I think there is a lot of value that can come from uh, epidemiologic studies. But when it comes to establishing causation, uh, 
there we cannot do that okay so let's let's start at the beginning then we'll start at the a, a starting point for what it means to uh make a causal statement okay um you know one of the things that uh well i guess i would say that any statement of causality um in epidemiology is based on induction okay inductive reasoning all right as opposed to deductive reasoning so you know what does that mean what is inductive reasoning well it it's it's uh reasoning from specific observations to general conclusions and deduction being the opposite you know reasoning from general principles to specific specific instances of uh observations in the world in the environment right um so for example if you have um well every every semester i teach two courses a year here i teach uh, infectious disease and i teach uh advanced epi methods okay so right now in the spring i that's when i teach epi methods and every semester i start out with a physics experiment okay and and actually i mean you can do this right now as you're sitting there in your office or you know people are sitting at home if you find somewhere uh within arm's reach a piece of metal or something made out of metal and you touch that and then subsequently you find uh something like your shirt perhaps made out of cloth uh, or even a piece of plastic and you touch that do you find a temperature difference in in the two materials and and of course you do and so what i do every every the beginning of every semester it's always the middle of the winter it's very cold we go outside at the beginning of the first class and i have all the students touch two objects that are outside one uh made of wood and one made of metal and it's just right outside our building and then we all go back inside and i ask them to you know describe their experience you you touched a piece of metal you touched a piece of wood which one was colder okay and inevitably always everyone always says well the the piece of metal was colder and that is of course the wrong answer <laughs> right the two objects are the same temperature as long as they've been exactly. you know in in the same environment for you know roughly the same amount of time they are the same temperature the reason that you perceive a difference is because uh metal and an object like a wood or your your uh, cotton shirt or a piece of plastic have differences in their ability to conduct okay metal is a good conductor plastic for example is not so what happens okay you hand touches a metal surface because that metal surface is a good conductor the heat that's in the tips of your fingers travels very quickly into the metal surface and because it travels from your fingers into the metal surface you notice you you perceive uh this change in temperature okay and it feels cold whereas when you touch something like the the surface of your shirt or a piece of plastic those are bad conductors so the heat doesn't transfer as readily and so you don't perceive the same kind of cold feeling okay the re- so why do i why do i bother with this well this is this i think is uh is a great example of the problem of inductive reasoning okay because what you've done what you've done is you've actually generated some data okay you just did an experiment and you have some observation some empirical evidence okay but because it's inductive because your conclusions are inductive they are they won't necessarily be wrong but in this case they are all right so it shows the limitations of purely observational or empirical evidence to prove uh causality okay, okay. um <clears throat> because you can't know if you collected all of the relevant data exactly exactly and in fact you can't know i mean what i teach is that you know another problem in uh in epidemiology or i i think just you know in a lot of sciences actually is the assumption that there is a one cause to one effect relationship in other words there's one thing that we can examine or isolate and uh we can associate that with one effect or one outcome okay one exposure one outcome and the reality is in the context of of uh disease exposure and outcomes especially in the context of 
epidemiology. I mean, laboratory work is a little bit different because of the control. So it 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 uh, is a little bit more prepared to make causal claims than epidemiology is. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, you have to consider a cause as a complete causal mechanism that is comprised of multiple actors, multiple mechanism, uh, multiple factors that are uh, acting in concert to uh, produce an outcome, to produce an effect. Okay, so the problem is, you know, just as Alan said, you cannot know all of the, you couldn't, you cannot, particularly in epidemiology, you can't have collected all of the relevant information, all the relevant data on all of the relevant variables in order to uh, make a statement of causality or to prove your association is true or not true uh, based on simple observational data. It's just not possible. Um, now, the gold standard can take you a little bit closer to to uh, claims of causality. And what I mean by the gold standard, that's the randomized control trial, uh, double-blinded. However, that is a, there's no guarantee of claims of causality based on that. Now, why would that be the case? Well, you know, randomization, the idea is that you're making the exposed and the non-exposed as similar as they can be based on randomly assigning exposure and not exposure to a group of people. Michael, right? Michael, hold yeah. on a sec. Uh, you're, you're breaking up. Can you plug and unplug sure. your uh, mic? He's got rich condits to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm cured. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, so why do we randomize? Well, we're trying to make the group of exposed and the non-exposed as close uh, to matching each other as possible on everything except for that exposure. Okay. So in doing that, then, you know, if we see an, an association between the exposure and the outcome, we can feel reasonably confident that that association is based on a real causal association. Okay. So randomization just neutralizes all of the other variables. Is that the idea? That's the idea. That's the idea. Okay. Now, that doesn't always work because uh, one of the biggest problems with uh, uh, randomized controlled trials is, well, they're expensive to do, first of all, and you will often have loss to follow-up, okay, or non-adherence to uh, whatever intervention a particular arm represents, whether that be a, a drug intervention for something like hypertension, for example, or a, uh, a, a condom use intervention to, to, to prevent HIV uh, spread. You know, whatever the case may be, <clears throat> You can randomize people to certain groups, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will uh, adhere to uh, the, the the assignment. Okay, and and w the worst part is that they won't necessarily adhere equivalently. Correct. Because if you lost equal numbers to follow up in both groups, it might even out. But if Absolutely. if the group that you're medicating is dropping out because they're getting side effects from the medication, then that's a factor that suddenly confounds it mm -hmm. right and, and the more causes there are for what you're looking at the worse it gets i presume absolutely so okay. asthma is one of those things yeah yeah <laughs> asthma is a, a tough tough nut to crack or headaches or you know uh, malaise or uh, yep. chronic fatigue syndrome i was gonna say chronic fatigue yeah syndrome. that's right no <laughs> there may be multiple causes for all of those things so randomizing your populations may not uh, sort right. it out at that level don't that's you? right that's right. Yep. And you know what? All of, the, all of the potential causes are not necessarily actors in right. every instance of a disease. Yeah. So, you know, some asthma may be due to pollution. Some asthma may be due to uh, pests. Some asthma may sure. be due to parents smoking in the That's home. Right. You know, you have to... Some right. may have genetic components. Exactly. So Jon exactly. Snow was really lucky that he picked cholera. I'd actually argue that everything <laughs> has at least some genetic component to it. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. I mean, the original observations that all of this is based on, I presume, was the mm -hmm. Jon Snow cholera. Everybody points back to that as the beginning of modern epidemiology. But what if the diarrheal diseases that they were experiencing were multiple and only one of them was caused by cholera? And oh yeah. Two others were caused by, you know, amebiasis and giardia, which yeah. wouldn't go away when you knocked over the pump. Um, right. He right. would have. Uh, well, then we never would have heard of him, and there would have been a different father of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Well, well you know what's interesting about John Snow <laughs> yeah, is ahead. that he was not a very rigorous epidemiologist. <laughs> that's true. He was kind of sloppy. Yeah. And there was a uh, a a, 
priest or a reverend that he worked very closely with mm. who was extraordinarily meticulous uh -huh. in um, enumerating uh, cases of cholera or, you know, whatever the diarrheal disease yeah. may have been. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, that, that extraordinary map uh, mm. that we have mm. of his cholera epidemic in London really comes from the data that was generated by uh, this uh, person of the cloth. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, is, is is interesting, yeah. So, Michael, if you want to do, say, look at it, the effect of a drug on hypertension, mm -hmm. there's there must be a population effect. So how do you deal with that? I mean, if you do a study in New York City, then you can't generalize it to the world, right? That's a great question. So, yeah, you're absolutely correct. So, you know, you, you, you all may have heard of uh, counterfactual arguments. Um Counterfactual arguments are sort of essential. They're, they're, it, it's something that's unrealizable, and I'll explain why. But it is essential in understanding uh, why, how and why uh, claims of causality can or cannot be put forward. Okay? So what it, a counterfactual argument is, uh, let me put this in the context of uh, exposure and disease. We'll take the same hypertensive example, okay? So you have two drugs, okay? Or let's say you just have one drug and a placebo. And what you want to know is if the administration of this drug, in other words, exposure, leads to a reduction in hy uh, hypertension, okay, disease. The only real way that you can identify whether or not uh, it, this drug causes, okay, an a, a decrease in hypertension in any given individual, in any specific individual, is to first administer the drug, okay, and watch what happens. Do they, you know, decrease hypertension or, you know, do they not? And then climb into your time machine, go back into time, and undo the experiment. Mm -hmm. And then watch them go forward in time again without the drug and see what happens. Okay, now that's obviously impossible. But what it does, what the counter, that's the counterfactual, okay, that, that you observe that which did not happen, okay, to see if it's the, the, the opposite to what you did actually has the opposite effect. And then, you know, from there you can determine whether or not it was caused by that. So this is obviously a physical impossibility. So, but what it does is it highlights what we're talking about when we talk about exposed and non-exposed, because essentially we're talking about uh, creating a population, creating a new population from one which is inherently different to the one we started with. Okay, so let me let me make that let me put that in simpler terms. We have an exposed group and we have an unexposed group. What we have to recognize is that this exposed group and this unexposed group are essentially two different populations. Right. Okay. They are two distinct populations, and what we're trying to do is go backward what we're trying to do is make the unexposed as similar as we possibly can to the exposed so that we can replicate that counterfactual uh process okay which is impossible to realize and and when you when you when you recognize it like this what you are ultimately led to is that whatever conclusions you draw are limited to the populations that you just studied okay mm -hmm. so now that's not to say that nothing has any generalizability, okay? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but God. you have to really define your populations. And oh, unfortunately, yeah. if you look at the epidemiology, the epidemiology literature, um, or, or I mean any of the medical literature really, the lack of adequate description of, popu of the study populations is mind-boggling. Exactly. Okay? Yeah. You need to know what is the... Um, what is the demographic makeup of these populations? What point in time did this happen? What is the, ge the geographical context? Okay, what is the health makeup of, of these two populations? I, I think, um, I can't remember if it was the paper that I sent you guys or from, from someplace else, but um, essentially one of the ways to, to deal with this is to sort of take the approach of clinical trials, which is when, it, when you look at the results of a clinical trial, one of the first things you see, usually it's the table one, is always 
did the randomization scheme work? So you have your, your exposure groups, okay, whatever, you know, different arms of the drug that's being administered, and you show all the demographics and all the other relevant data and how those are similar or different based on those two exposure arms or however many exposure arms, okay? That does not happen in most of the observational studies, and it absolutely needs to happen because otherwise, you, you know, you, you, you have no idea what's going on, how these populations are similar or different. If they're vastly different then the conclusions that you, uh, well, first of all, you really can't draw any conclusions, okay, because uh, That's you know, right. an, anything could be contributing to, to the association that you find. So the biggest, I, I don't mean to jump in here, but mm-hmm. it's this very exciting stuff because this takes me back to my old days as a student here mm-hmm. in the School of Public Health where we had you know, statistics and epidemiology and all this other stuff. So mm-hmm. we have raging right now in this country something that's being referred to as an epidemic of obesity, Mm-hmm. And it's up to 30% in most states. Mm-hmm. And the cause for this has been yet to be identified. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're claiming people are overeating or they're eating junk food and they're doing this or they're doing that. And none of that plays out in terms of long-term studies. And, and you've got a population that's – they started the epidemic when they, it was back in the 1980s and now these are older people and they're, they're carrying this thing forward with them. Mm-hmm. And How do you go back – to that time when, they, when there were not 30%, let, let's say it was 10% or 5%. Right. And, and what is the break point? And, and what is the other population, like you were saying, that acts as the controls for the ones that became obese? Right, right. And How do you go backwards and still... Well, and, and that particular um, uh, pandemic it now is, yes. uh, you can't even necessarily do international comparisons exactly. because this is now happening mm-hmm. throughout the world and mm-hmm. and it also unfortunately seems to track demographically right and even if you even if you were able to do i mean in terms of differences in uh, you know, big differences in, in the rates of obesity across country you really still couldn't do that comparison because there's right. so many other factors that could be contributing to why one population has right. high levels of obesity and why one doesn't so it really um it, it would that uh, you know very tough. Um, but Michael, doesn't this rel- remind you of the situation that existed with ulcers before they discovered the common cause for ulcers? Well, yeah, it's very, well. See, <laughs> actually, I think it's the opposite. Oh. And the reason I would say that is because, well, I don't know if the opposite is the right word, but um, the ulcers, you know, have an infectious etiology. Yeah, right? but we didn't know that then. Right. But um, now, I, I actually. I think there, as, as we learn more and more about the microbiome, in particular the gut microbiome, uh, I think there's a huge role that could be played by uh, the balance that's, that's maintained. Or there may be even be you know, a specific etiologic pathogen or pathogens that are involved in uh, obesity. But it's, it, even if that's the case, it's not going to happen in isolation from... Um, other factors, other envir- environmental factors, you know, the, the consumption of more refined uh, foods, you know, for example, and, and access to places where you can have healthy uh, physical activity, you know, for example. The, you know, these are, these are still uh, factors that, that, you know, seem to play a role in the occurrence of obesity. Um, so I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, we, we've reached a point now where um, there's really not an opportunity for any kind of a natural experiment in an observational study. Um, I think, you, you know, it, it really just harps on the fact that uh, when you're, you, you know, we're studying a, a phenomenon, that being obesity, that is multifactorial in the causal mechanism um, that's involved. And you know what? There may be certain populations where, uh, you know, certain things are more important than others. Um, you know, there may be certain populations because of diet that have most of the people in the community have altered microbiomes, you know? I mean, this is, a, this is another, this is, this is a great area that's ripe for research. Yeah, no to, kidding. To right. do, you know, uh, microbiology, to do, yeah. you know, large surveys, population-based surveys on, on folks' microbiology in their gut, on their skin, um, yeah. in their mouths. You know, I mean, it, it's... Um, Fascinating. It's interesting, yeah. Well, in that connection, that 
the genome-wide association studies that people mm. try and do, they just forget about the microbiome, and that's probably yeah. not right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> if they're interacting. Yep. I wanted to just get back briefly to the mm-hmm. to the geographic issue. So, if you test a hypertensive drug in mm-hmm. India, can mm-hmm. you use it in the U.S.? Well, I think um, this this comes down again to taking a, a, a wide view of what's at play in terms of the causal mechanisms. Okay, so if if you're basing that application of those findings to potential intervention here or potential intervention in you know China or potential intervention in wherever, okay, the first thing you have to know is very specifically. Uh, what what was going on in in the population where this drug was studied? Okay, what does that population look like in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of um, other factors that are going on? You know, as much as you can diet, collect diet, that, would matter diet too, right? absolutely, yeah. diet, physical activity. Um, mm-hmm. But that isn't enough because basically what you have to do is then sit down and think in terms of the causal pathways wherein these other factors may be relevant and how these other factors may translate into effectiveness or lack of effectiveness. I'm not saying efficaciousness, but effectiveness in a, an entirely different population. Okay, So there's no, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think uh, particularly in medical research, or, or not in medical research, but in medical practice, um, People always want, physicians often want algorithms or checklists of things. And that's very difficult. Uh, It really has no application in etiologic research, which is what we're talking about here. You can't just go down a checklist and say, okay, well, you know, we've met this, we've met this, we've met this. And so, yeah, this should translate into uh, an effective intervention for hypertension in the United States or in Brazil or wherever. You mean Dr. House Uh, doesn't have the right methods? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> come on i've been watching well, that show for a long the, time he's now. got the right right methods for, for <laughs> dealing with people right? that's right yeah oh he's pretty <laughs> gruff actually <laughs> i ask because we've had questions in the past if you test an h1n1 vaccine in australia can you then assume it's going to work in the u.s so the, the the things you said have to apply in order to uh test. yeah now infectious disease i think is not it, it, the, the relationships in infectious disease, I don't want to make a blanket statement, mm-hmm. but uh, they can be less complex in terms – because the outcome can be less complex. I mean, the, 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 I mean, well, not the outcome, but the relationship between the exposure and the outcome. There's always going to be a pathogen that leads to a specific disease. Mm-hmm. Now, the way that's quantified can be – totally messed up. I mean, in terms, you know, we, we have an example right now with the H5N1 uh, case fatality, you know, that's, that's talked about incorrectly. And, Thank you, you know, <laughs> but nevertheless, nevertheless, in the context of etiology, you have a pathogen or a set of pathogens that leads to a disease. So, um, you know, I, I think you are less, you, you know, you're less likely to uh, end up in a pitfall with in the context of vaccinations um, or, or infectious disease etiology than you are with something like obesity as your outcome or or asthma or cardiovascular disease where you have just you know phenomenal uh, phenomenally broad causal mechanisms that are at play and can be acting in you know very differently in different contexts. If well, you, and the, the outcome you're measuring in an infectious disease study is, um, not to oversimplify, but it, it's almost binary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you're either either yep. you've got protective antibodies against, in the flu example, either you developed protective antibodies against flu yeah. or you didn't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you can measure those antibody titers, and we know from past experience those will correlate pretty well with protection. Yeah. Um, so if Australians are developing antibodies against the vaccine you tested on them, then you can safely assume that people right. all over the world will. But the only difference there, I think, would be whether your immune system is fully active or not when you start these studies. Uh, malnutrition, for instance, has a huge mm. impact on vaccination and also uh, sure. the presentation mm. of disease. Mm. So that has to be factored in. And that's so, yeah, so if you're, in a, you're, you're studying a population where there's massive amounts of uh, diarrheal disease and malnutrition, yeah, which sort of go yeah. you know, hand in hand, 
along with measles, exactly. Um, you know, you may have a very different immunogenicity. That's right. Than you would in, say, the population of Australia, for example. Yep. Right. If there are um, radical differences between the two yeah. populations I mean, like that. One, of, one yeah. of the biggest issues there. I mean, uh, when they when Bangladesh was first founded as a country, mm-hmm. one of the biggest problems they found was the people were iron deficient. Mm. So they corrected that, and the moment they did, they their latent malaria blossomed. And the mortality rate among children was incredible. Uh, they had to stop this supplement in their diet for iron and correct really? malaria. So was that due to hookworm or was it due to – Yeah, it was diet. and diet. It had two and things, diet, diet well. and, and hookworm. But it also made malaria less pathogenic. The moment huh. they corrected yeah. the iron deficiency, the red cell production went yeah. up and the, and the malarial parasites killed we, these little kids. You know, it's, it's interesting because – with uh, in malaria, and uh, you know, you guys know this, of course. In malaria, what you when you have iron supplementation, uh, you can have increases in parasitemia, right. but decreases in the level of severe malaria yeah. uh, that it, that occurs. So, it, exactly. it, fascinating. Uh, so, Michael, what's I, wrong with the H five N one case fatalities? Right. Tell Let's us. just get to I the chase your, here. I want your view. Because what's not wrong with it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Because <laughs> last night at uh, the New York Academy, Mike Osterholm. So were you at the? Were you at the? I was the there. I was you on, were there. I was on mm-hmm. the. Uh, it was the a panel, presenter, mm-hmm. and uh, Peter Palazzi was telling us about the Cerro surveys, and Mike Osterholm told him he, they're all crap, and he was wrong. So yeah, I saw some of that on tweet on uh, Twitter. Um, okay, well, you know, there's there's a glaring problem here. Um, and I know you, you know, you've touched on this on, uh, you've had, you've had a couple publications on this and Alan, you've had it on your, uh, blog, but the, the reality is we've got a, a, a big mis- mismeasurement issue going on here. Okay. Um, this is one of the fundamental things. I mean, this is, it doesn't get any more fundamental than this in epidemiology. And that is we need to know what we're measuring. What are the measures of occurrence that we're, before you can get to measures of association, you got to know what the measure of occurrence is, okay? How are you defining the thing that you're measuring in a population? Are you looking at prevalence? Are you looking at incidence? Um, how is that being measured? So the problem we have here in the context of the H5N1 research moratorium is that they're claiming this uh, very high uh, case fatality rate, uh, 60% or 58%, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. And... Um, and that is based on the number of deaths that have occurred uh, among people who have been hospitalized uh, and, and enumerated. I mean, there's probably some people who have been hospitalized uh, that actually didn't go on to die who were, in fact, infected with H5N1. Uh, but this is based on the enumeration of these 600 or so people who have been hospitalized and the number of deaths that have occurred among that group. Mm-hmm. But it, what we have to recognize here, there, there, there are a few fundamental concepts in infectious disease epidemiology, and, and nobody gets out of my class without knowing these. Otherwise, they don't, you know, they're not passing. You have to know the difference between uh, infectivity, pathogenicity, and virulence. Okay, so in, infectivity is the capacity of a, a pathogen, be it viral, bacterial, parasitic. The, the capacity of a pathogen to infect a host. What do we mean by infecting a host? It, is it replicating in the host? Okay, and we can identify that by the uh, antibody response, typically. I mean, if there is a, uh, an assay available. Um, so the ability of a pathogen to infect a host defines its infectivity. The ability of a pathogen to cause disease ah. defines its pathogenicity. Roger that. And the degree... Of disease which occurs is what defines the virulence. Okay, so what we're seeing here in these hospitalized uh, six hundred. Uh, and in all, in all cases, you need. I mean, if you're going to talk about virulence, mm-hmm. you need the you need the infectivity, right? You mm-hmm. need a denominator. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, I was just about to get to the denominator. So we have here this uh, you know unfortunate uh, group of six hundred people, and it, you know it, it's horrible. Um, the 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 number who 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 died among them, um, but what we have is the infections that were the most virulent, the the ones who that caused the the most severe disease. Okay, what we don't have are the rest. 
Okay, we don't have the people who had uh, maybe had disease, but were just uh, mild disease. So they didn't feel uh, it wasn't so extreme that they went to a hospital. Okay, uh, or or were admitted, you know, to a hospital. Maybe they it was bad enough that they even went to see their local doctor. Okay, but they weren't the sickest of the sick. Okay, then you have some people who you know they they may have been infected and just had a, a runny nose, uh, slight cough. And the thing passed, you know, very quickly. So they actually, that was, it was pathogenic in them, but very, very mildly so. And it didn't even up, interrupt their lives, okay? Then you have the folks who, in whom uh, the, the, uh, the virus was infective, it, it was able to replicate, but it was completely asymptomatic, okay? It didn't cause any uh, symptoms, and they didn't even know they had it. And, and there's some indication that this is more common than we think because based on uh, early serology studies, uh, we're identifying that you know, there, there are groups of people in Southeast Asia who have antibody evidence of H5N1 infections but have never had any clinical signs or symptoms. Okay? So ultimately what we need to be asking is we have this number up in the numerator which identifies the number of deaths. Okay? Who goes in the denominator? Okay, out of, we're counting the number of deaths out of whom, all right? Now, case fatality as a uh, quantitative tool, okay, is typically defined as the number of cases, uh, the number of deaths out of the, the total number of diagnosed infections, okay, diagnosed cases. Now, usually, that denominator is the total number of people who present with disease, okay? So it actually usually does exclude uh, asymptomatic infections because in a practical sense, when you're doing outbreak investigation especially, um, those people are not accessible, okay? Ideally, we would have the total number, we would have not, we wouldn't be even talking about case fatality. What we'd be talking about is mortality, okay? Which is the total number of deaths out of the total number of at, at risk, all right? So who goes in the denominator? Well, first of all, whether or not you, you want to take a, a very strict approach to case fatality or a more loose approach, uh, more loose meaning that you include anybody who's infected, even if they're asymptomatic, and a more strict approach means you include those people who are, are diagnosed, who are symptomatic, basically, who have some clinical manifestation, okay? In either scenario, you are still having a much larger denominator than the denominator that's presented uh, these 600 people, okay, who have who are the sickest of the sick, all right. That is not an accurate denominator, because that denominator doesn't incorporate all symptomatic disease. It doesn't incorporate all the clinical cases. All the clinical cases are not being hospitalized, okay. We're missing most of them because most of them, when you get a cold, you go to work, right? You you continue on with your lives. Your kids still get up at six in the morning. They still need. You to be around, so you know you 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 go through life. You feel crappy for a few days, and you move on. Uh, I can even get a pretty bad case of flu, and I won't go to the hospital. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and given where this is taking place in rural areas in Asia, right. Right. Um, right. even people who go to their local hospital mm-hmm. are probably, in, in many cases, not getting fully worked up with an H five N one PCR assay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So they they get sick enough to go to the hospital and and end up there perhaps and uh, and then they get better, right, right. So why? So I suppose WHO understands this, mm-hmm. right? But they publish fifty percent of people infected have died. Mm-hmm. Actually, I don't know if that's their language. I should check it. But then mm-hmm. the press picks it up and and calls it a sixty percent fatality. Right. Well, I mean, I have an opinion on why that is. Do you sure. Think? Yeah, I want to know. Sure. Because we are motivated, motivated by a culture of fear. Correct. You know, I mean, I think, um, well, I think there's, there's a couple of things that are at play. One is that, you know, we, we sort of live in this culture of fear, and uh, any time that any infectious disease story can be sensationalized, holy cow, is it going to be? You That's know, right. especially, you know, now we've got movies like Contagion. <laughs> and, you know, I, I mean, on the one hand, people are starting to actually know what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and not think that I'm, not think that I'm a dermatologist, 
um, <laughs> when I say I'm an epidemiologist. But right. on the other hand, you know, it it, it creates uh, it just an, it it reinforces this culture of fear. But uh, it, you know, that's one thing. The other thing is that there's a lot of money behind um, bio defense. You know, and and unfortunately, I mean, I think there's an imbalance there in how and how that gets uh, distributed. So, you know, there are people who have there are whole departments in academic institutions that are uh, that that rely upon these funds, and that you know, people who, whose careers. Uh, <laughs> for sure. Just to yeah. mention it. Yeah. Yeah. So the WHO calls it calls it a case fatality rate. That's correct. Mm-hmm. That is the, the correct overall term. case fatality rate seventy three, sixty, forty three, whatever. No, that's a correct on. use. That's correct. That is correct. But then the, the newspapers say that this proves that it's lethal. It is lethal, but it's in those people. Yes. Well, that's their, yeah. Their, this is this is a level of nuance that is very difficult to fit into a fifty word lead. Yeah. They're running in exactly. circles, basically. Exactly. Well, the problem is that – so we are assuming that there are always mild or asymptomatic infections, which mm-hmm. I think is a reasonable assumption and I think even occurs for Ebola virus, mm-hmm. for example. There's evidence for that. So, And you get evidence by looking in people for antibodies to these viruses, people who aren't hospitalized. Right. And, and there are some studies that have been done for H5N1, but they are discounted by the people who, uh, well, in particular NSABB members, discount it. They don't believe it. And that's the problem I have is that if it's published and the data are there, why don't you believe it? And if you don't believe it, why don't you go out and get the data? Right. I think there's sufficient evidence to tell us that the uh, fatality – so should we call it a fatality rate then? So what is the number of deaths over the total number of infections? What's that number? Well, it depends. Okay, What's so the, the, the case all. fatality rate, technically, is yeah. the number of deaths over the total number of diagnosed cases. Okay, now diagnosed cases—that's where there's all yeah. this room for interpretation and misinterpretation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mortality think rate is what we're is, trying yeah, to get. Yeah, I, I think at, right? what's more useful is a mortality rate, wherein the numerator is again the number of deaths, but the denominator is the number who are at risk. Okay, so that's the people who are. That also is open, obviously, to interpretation because who's at risk? Is it those who are demonstrate any evidence of past infection, you know, based on serology, or is it, you know, a specific group of uh, geographic uh, designation of people? Um, but I think, in terms of, you know, a useful metric for the immediate what we need right now, it would be the total number of cases over uh, the number of evidenced. Infections. Okay. okay. And by evidenced infections, I mean, you know, either evidence based on uh, serology or medical. Here's another thing: medical abstraction. You can actually find out quite a bit uh, from doing medical abstractions in hospitals. You know, not just in, in in the United States where everything is automated now, but you know, I did a bunch of that actually in India, and um, you know, some countries like India keep excellent records. Um, I mean, it depends on a hospital, obviously, but uh, if it's an adequately resourced hospital, uh, you may find that actually you can go back and do medical record. Now, that's a lot of work. Okay, that's labor intensive. But, you know, if it's a government led operation and you have uh, personnel and resources to sort of, you know, sample a, a group of hospitals in a, in a district, for example, um, that could be another, you know, approach to. In, exactly, ILI, I-L-I, so influenza-like illness, right? I mean, you do that so, with asthma all the uh, time, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. I have a question. What, what, what do we ordinarily? I mean, we have these numbers that we throw around for. Uh, I don't know what you want to. I'm, uh, I'm getting confused. I'm not getting confused, but I got a lot of terminology to deal with here. I got virulence. <laughs> I got pathogenicity. I got mortality. <laughs> uh, we throw a lot of numbers out for the. Uh, badness, if you like, of seasonal strains Mm -hmm. or the 1918 flu. And it seems to me that if we're going to do comparisons, we've got to use the same units for all of these. Okay? So what is typically used to assess how bad 
the seasonal flu is and 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 how bad do we really know the 1918 flu was can we use do we have the same sort of data can we use the same sort of units and so uh, how are we going to define what we, what the baseline is that we ought to be comparing this supposedly badder thing to yeah rich that's a that's a fantastic question that's that's the question and you know here in the US we have um many levels of good surveillance for uh, for flu, actually, okay, for seasonal flu. We have uh, different operations that involve um, sentinel surveillance, so you have, you know, key um, hospitals and, and practitioners located, at, you know, in different uh, cities and geographic locations around the country who are active, and, and this is another key distinction here, the difference between active and passive surveillance. Um, active surveillance is obviously a lot more costly because what you have to do is actively um, canvas communities and 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 uh, clinical institutions for what's happening, what they're seeing, what their experience is. Okay. Um, now we have uh, many operations that are that are you know by the CDC as well as by local and state health departments. Um, that are operate and, and by public health laboratories. You know, there's a huge public health laboratory effort for influenza, um, and you know, it's it's the implementation of multi-tiered surveillance that we are able to make nuanced distinctions between um, uh, infections that are not so severe that can be you know classified within the context of influenza-like illness. And infections that are quite severe, leading to uh, either primary uh, pneumonia or secondary bacterial pneumonia and death, particularly in uh, in people who are over the age of 65. Um, but ultimately, you know, you you hit on a, a fantastic uh, point, which is this is unique. I mean, the the, the ability for of of us to be able to implement this kind of surveillance relies upon a massive mobilization of clinical practitioners, public health uh, surveillance specialists, uh, uh, r other resources, and all kinds of uh, machinery, you know, that has to be in place. And there's a lot of places in the world that don't, there's just no way. There's no so that, way. That's where we ought to be spending that's the it. money instead of building BSL-4 labs. Yes, I mean, yes. Yeah, Getting, H5 no, surveillance and, is, and is here's crap, the thing, right? Here's the thing. Surveillance <laughs> is, I'm sorry, what did you say? The That's, H5 surveillance isn't anywhere near like oh, you've described, no, right? No, 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 not at all, not at all. Because what has to happen every year? Every year, we need something to be renewed. The, the vaccines. We need new vaccines every year. So there is there is a whole process, a whole machinery that's at work to monitor from the southern hemisphere where the new, they, they begin every year up to the northern hemisphere uh, where the, the relevant strains end. Every, you know, there's, there's an incredible machinery that's in place. Um, but this does not, this is not the case for, for bird flu or, or for uh, avian influenza. Now, if we took steps to enhance the global surveillance, uh, global surveillance systems, that means we invest in um, countries, you know, developing countries' efforts to uh, monitor infections, man, that is going to have a tremendous effect on public health the world over. And not just with respect to flu, but with respect to infectious disease, period. OK, because any effort to try to eliminate, you know, whether we're talking about uh, eliminating malaria by you know, 2020, or whatever it is, which I, I, I don't think is realistic. I don't either. Uh, <laughs> and uh, el eliminating uh, measles from sub-Saharan Africa, any of these uh, problems, OK, there is a fundamental need for good surveillance, here, here. OK, because if you don't have good surveillance, you don't know what you have. You don't exactly. know what's out there. Exactly. So. The, and not, you know, money doesn't get spent on surveillance. It gets spent on uh, more tangible things, things that you can see, like bed nets. And you know, there, there's there's a huge need for bed nets, obviously, in, in uh, the fight against malaria and other arthropod-borne infections. But so, you know, we we often overlook this fundamental need for monitoring disease. Okay, even though it's clearly worked 
for for us in the United States and sure. you know places in Europe. But this is money needs to get there, and it's not, and that's a big problem. Yeah, Michael, one of the biggest disappointments I had in my entire scientific career was listening to people who were engaged in birth control, uh-huh. and um, they were well intentioned, obviously, and what they wanted to do was to distribute condoms. Uh-huh. And they did. They did a lot of that. And, uh, in fact, they did it throughout Southeast Asia and throughout South America mm-hmm. uh, where they weren't confronted with religious constraints, etc. Mm-hmm. And so then I asked, well, you did your job and you got the condoms distributed. Now, what is the effect? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they looked at me and they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, how did you measure – uh, before condom use and after condom use in terms of the birth rate. Mm-hmm. And, and, of course, they said, well, we don't do that. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. I thought you were trying to keep the population from expanding at a more yeah. rapid rate than, than would have been possible if you had some constraints. And mm-hmm. So all you need is one day of yeah. noncompliance, and you've increased the birth rate, and you've yeah. destroyed an entire program. Yeah. So they had no surveillance. In other words, yeah. that was what it really was driving at. They you know had no surveillance. A, you know what's a great example of uh, sad, sad. surveillance? Latin America and measles. Oh, yeah? Okay. The PAHO, uh, the oh, Pan- sure. Pan American Health Organization, sure, sure. Uh, has done a fantastic job of uh, coming very close now to eliminating measles from the Western Hemisphere. Now, of course, if it comes back, it'll probably be because of people who don't vaccinate in the United States. But... Um, you know, and, and, and it comes down to, you know, a lot of countries in Latin America uh, are resource, resource stretched. You know, they don't have a lot of resources, but they've made some key decisions. There have been uh, people in place to make some key decisions that put the money where it needed to be. Now, of course, some of that money is in the actual administration of, of vaccines, but then in addition, good surveillance mechanisms. Okay. So, you know, measles is pretty much gone from the Western Hemisphere. And that's, you know, a big part of that is recognizing the usefulness sure. of surveillance. Polio, too. And, and polio as well, of course, yeah. Yeah, but this one, the, you know, the, it's interesting, too, when you looked at the outbreak of SARS, mm-hmm. and everyone assumed that it was respiratory in terms of its transmission cycle, it turned out not to be. And the, the people who were dying from it were the ones that were exposed to other uh, bodily secretions, um, particularly feces in this feces, case. Feces, yeah. And... Yeah. You know, to protect yourself against one thing when you're not understanding the transmission cycle means you're opening yourself up to something else. And yeah. and that's where H5N1 suffers because we don't really understand fully the epidemiology mm. of the transmission for this virus. Mm. And that's where the fear comes because we're afraid that it will mutate enough to transmit from person to person, which it hasn't done yet. Mm. And that's what this whole controversy, I think, is about, the lack of understanding. So it makes – I'm on Vince's side 100 percent on this one. It makes no sense to say that we, since we don't understand this, yeah. let's stop yeah. working on it. I mean isn't that crazy? <laughs> you know, you think about what That has is the been opposite of achieved. every other approach we've ever taken for any other disease. Yeah, exactly. I, think about I've what's never been known achieved. this to work in any other way except this mm-hmm. one. Well, mm-hmm. it seems likely that uh, certain kinds of H5N1 research will be – uh, required to be done under BSL-4 containment now. Well, this that is, restricts who can uh, work on yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. This is oh. just absurd. How and many are there even in the country? It's less than well, – it's only a few. There's right? one in Hamilton, Montana, I know, because that's where I trout fish. Actually, there's three of them in Frederick right on top of each other. Yeah. Huh. And who works in them? Which is, a, which is one, a little crazy. There's at least one in Texas. Well, the one at CDC, right? There's one in Fort Collins, Fort I Collins. think. Fort Collins, yeah, yeah, Fort Collins. But, uh, yeah. They're still, in the process of building some more, I think. They're all government facilities. They're not uh, civilian facilities yeah. at all. It's very expensive. The BCL-3 is the highest level in civilian, I think. And it pretty much precludes, uh, you know, if this is going to be what's taken on by the scientific community, it precludes the ability safe. to do this kind of research in Southeast Asia, in the developing world, uh, where it also, you know, it needs to happen there. <laughs> By the way, I just uh, I just pulled up some case fatality rates for 2009 H1N1. Aha. Yeah. Um, there's one study from Mexico where um, of the critically ill patients they yeah. looked at, yeah. um, they had a 41.4 percent case fatality rate. Interesting. Um, really? Now that's a small that's a small study. Um, there's a larger year? one from California um, where they had uh, an overall case fatality rate of 11 percent. Right. Uh, that's out of 1,088 cases of yeah. hospitalization. Yeah. 
And as we know, the 2009 H1N1 was a, was milder than most seasonal flus. That's right. Well, if you look at the CDC numbers for the whole 2009, they actually break it down to um, hospitalizations and fatalities. Okay? So if you just do the math, fatalities divided by hospitalizations, it can go as high as 20%. So and that's just a typical seasonal flu. Yeah, yeah. But, right. but look who's being hospitalized, though, right? What's exactly. the age group? Yeah, that's and- probably with a, with a larger denominator than we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. yeah, you, yeah, when you're talking about hospitalizations, you're talking about people who are already more susceptible. That's to- exactly right. It's the older populations mostly and uh, people who are already weak from just – And those are and those are data from a developed country. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So this is what's driving this, you know, all of these individuals who want to censor the research. Do you want to take a chance that we're going to kill half of the world's population when, in fact, it's not even remotely near that? And mm-hmm. and so I, I just find this misinformation objectionable. Um, it's fear-mongering. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, someone if, last... If you look, if you look at the, the general um, H1N1 data... I mean the 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 seasonal flu because this is also based on H three N two. There's, I mean, it's very hard to to estimate you know an exact incidence, but it's basically somewhere uh, between uh, thirty and fifty million estimated cases in the U S alone every year, and there are approximately thirty five thousand or so deaths. Um, and, 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 you know, that's, you can't look at that generically, that 36,000, because that's a very specific subtype of the population. Um, maybe we can expect it to be a bit higher than that for H5N1, but certainly not 60%. Well, and that's assuming that the virus can actually sustain transmission and and pathogenicity at the same time in a human population, which we haven't seen yet. Yeah. So here's a typical exchange from last night. Um, so Peter Palazzi said, you can always assume the worst. I mean, pigs can fly. But I think all the evidence we have right now doesn't suggest that these H5N1 viruses can be easily transmitted in humans. Where do you stop in terms of being afraid? And mm-hmm. Mike Osterholm said, I sit here with some emotion when I say this. Damn it, this is a real possibility. And if we're wrong, the consequences will be so catastrophic that we will all go back and ask ourselves, why did it happen? So there you have reason followed by unreason. <laughs> yeah. And right. that's what happened all night. Too very, bad. Very disturbing. Mm. So there are great summaries at uh, Nature. And also um, Carl Zimmer has posted his, his – uh, well, I think that, that, sort of, that sort of mentality is what happens when you spend a lot of time immersed in this yes. uh, sort of vessel of the NSABB. The doomsday uh, you, scenarios. That's yeah, all they you, do all day long is talk about can, doomsday scenarios. Yeah, you so. can get, you can, it, would, it would not be too difficult to get sucked into that if you're, if yeah, you're, you're, quite right. if you're sort of bathed in that environment all the time. Well, Rich, Those uh, interested in the sociology of a situation like that should look at the Bay of Pigs and a phenomenon called groupthink. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. So, yeah. Rich, um, last night... Um, I just lost my train of thought. What are we talking? Oh yeah, the think tank, the think mentality. So these guys said over and over again, we've spent hundreds of hours talking about this, the NSABB guys, and we have a lot of information that you guys don't have, and we can't tell you why we reached this. Thing. Yeah. All right. Oh, this is the theme over. We spent hundreds of hours, and we have a lot of experts we talked to, but we can't tell you why. Right. And I find this objectionable. That's and I yeah. told them, look. You have to understand our position. You're not telling us why you're making this decision. For us, it, it looks stupid. And if you can't tell us, mm-hmm. we're going we're to be pissed off. And they're doing, they're doing in silico research, I'm sure, you know, that constitutes most of their quote-unquote evidence. You know, they're, they're modeling things uh, mathematically, but, you know, it's not based on evidence. No, it doesn't seem to be. No, that's not rigorous epidemiologic. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you hide behind the, uh, the screen of secrecy, and uh, you you don't uh, you're not privy to this level of information. You're only mm-hmm. level three, and this is a level four. Uh, then you yeah. suspect that there is some hearsay and some self servingness about all of that. Yeah. And right, we can't evaluate evidence we can't see. Correct. Yeah. 
Um, uh, well, Correct. <laughs> So this was a show about epidemiology. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's okay. We well, got... actually, the, uh, this has been a, a good drift, okay, yeah. from basic epi- right. epidemiology right. through right. a really current problem that needs an appropriate epidemiologic analysis. I, this that's is right. this is perfect. And actually, I think, Alan, what you just said about evaluating knowledge is that just stems right from my sort of central tenet in epidemiology, which is we cannot evaluate truth. <laughs> okay, I, I mean, I believe that there are scientific truths that exist in the world. You know, some are truthy, some are not so truthy. Perhaps you, you know, you can evaluate truthiness, but uh, I, I believe that we cannot evaluate truth. What we can evaluate is knowledge. We can evaluate data. Okay, but we can, as an epidemiologist, I cannot evaluate truth, even though those truths may exist. We can do that in the lab, though, right? Rich, well, you, we, you have more, yeah, you have more control, uh, but right. we don't have that kind of control in, yeah. the, in the field. You're starting and to when I write like, a sequencing gel, or when I used to, yes. when, <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, yeah, that's truth. I can rely yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, I know that yeah, sequence sure. is correct. Right, right. You, you, you but have, we don't have that luxury of yeah. control. Pla- plaques are real. <laughs> right, and the the effect sizes in the lab are massively greater than the effect sizes mm-hmm. that you're looking for in an epidemiological study. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, if you do if you do a virology experiment, and you don't see two logs difference. Well, then there's no difference. Mm-hmm. Um, it's <laughs> yeah. That's why I like lab work. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, for a time as an undergraduate, <clears throat> I spent time in the field doing uh, animal behavior, and mm-hmm. uh, forget it. You know, I had, I had, that's right. That's, I had no control. Yeah. Under carefully controlled environmental conditions, the organism yeah. does what it pleases. Yeah. <laughs> I think the biggest fear that everybody has is that we're confronting another AIDS-like epidemic, and the first time we hit one of those things, no one paid attention, mm. and we know what happened. And now you're at another crossroads for another organism, and the same thing is likely to happen. No, the same thing is not likely to happen. It's a totally different situation. But nonetheless, they're using the old scenario of, look what happened the last time we ignored all of that other stuff. And so this time we're going to crack down on this. We're going to be super sure of everything before we proceed. And, you know, some other group working on this, some other place is going to discover what the real truth is, basically. Some other country without a regulation-laden uh, scientific community. But it won't be an epidemiologist. But it will not, it will not repeat. It will not be an epidemiologist. An, ABA, an epidemiologist may be contributing and, and should right. be contributing. But That's it, right. That person won't be the, the truth finder. That's, or an that. epidermologist either. <laughs> yeah, right. So like epidemiology kind of <clears throat> way tells you where to look. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think it, 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 um, how to look. it, it, how it helps look. to right. uh, identify important signals. Yeah. You know, and and uh, you know, but outside of the lab, we just don't have the the ability to control. So you know, right the now, way that you do inside Michael, the lab, and if you had a bottom, we're always going to be limited because of that. If you had a bottom line to tell the world what's missing that needs to be known first before you can make a cogent uh, argument pro or uh, con for the current uh, situation, what would it be? For H five N one. Oh, wow. What a great question. Um, I guess uh, I would want to know more about transmission. Here. I would, I would want to know more. There's a couple of things. One, I would want to know more specifically about transmission. Right. And again, we need, we need laboratory results for that as well, um, as well as field, epidemiologic field results. Mm-hmm. And I'd also want, I'd want to know what that denominator is. We need to know. That's... You know? True. That's the, ba- that. that's the basic truth. So yeah. don't we have enough syrup banked away someplace that we could already just do that just by surveying that? No. Maybe in, maybe in Norway. <laughs> <laughs> but so I don't think in, in most of the world. Not in China or in Southeast Asia or uh, in, uh, not the right one. Indonesia. Uh, you need rural farmers with chickens and birds in their backyards. Yeah. Okay. And that there's not – the, the few studies that have been positive, okay. that's who they have looked at. Okay. Mm-hmm. These are people who inhale the virus all the time yeah. mm-hmm. and get little infections and mild disease. And yeah. Michael, right, because it's, it's a digestive virus. It's a, a GI tract virus sure. for birds, right? Yeah. Birds, right. What is that's your right. end, uh, satisfactory end for this one? The number of people for mm-hmm. the denominator? Mm-hmm. Um. Well, I mean, it would depend on the number. Okay, let me let me 
paint a, a quick picture. So uh, we're talking about, uh, let's say, a Southeast Asian country, um, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, you know, take your pick, where, and, and we're talking about an agrarian uh, community where this is taking place. It's, you know, what the end is going to be is going to, okay, so a priori, we have some sense, you know, based on the data that we have so far of which communities are likely to be affected. So if the agrarian communities are um, 90% of the population of said country, then you need to have a much larger N, okay? If the, the, uh, that, the, the community is, you know, 10% of the population in a neighboring country, and you could, I mean, this is a very real scenario. You could think of Vietnam as being more agrarian than Thailand, for example. Um, then you would need a smaller N, you know, because you'd be able to go into a smaller proportion of the country and uh, select adequately enough to have a represent because we're talking about representativeness here, a representative uh, sample. So there's no there's no one answer to that. It depends on the subpopulations and how those are uh, defined and and you know how they're constituted. So, uh, um, Vincent, did anybody last night bring up that point at least? Of, of what they needed? Yeah, how to, def- no. how to defuse the situation. No, no, no. no, they don't want us to do any more work. They want to not Even on an epidemiological paper. level. No, there was nothing. They're convinced that this is a highly lethal virus. It's going to kill a lot of people or there's a good possibility that it will. They don't, want, they don't think about anything else to do because right now all they want to do is stop the research. But it, at the end of the day, isn't it still the case that uh, as far as this moratorium goes, um, this is something – that it has been accepted by the scientific community, and can't we flip that around and say, you know, for example, a, a petition? Um, I know we've had, you know, there, you guys submitted a letter, uh, but what if we had a collective voice, you know, with signatures? That My said, very, very strong suspicion um, is that this is this quote-unquote voluntary moratorium was not quite as voluntary okay. as has been stated. Yeah, that's true. I agree with you. That's just, that's just a guess yeah, based yeah. on hearsay. But I, I strongly suspect that, some, that people were presented with a choice of either you volunteer to do this or you're going to be volunteered to do it. Yeah, you lose your funding. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's correct, and I think there's a lot of pressure from political arenas, who, from people who don't understand this and who suspect that American money was used to make a, a biological weapon, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I have often thought a petition of, you know, if you could get thousands of signatures, it would be good. But in the end, uh, they're not going to look at it. Not going to go right. anywhere. I mean, it makes, your, it makes the NSABB feel that, that there's some pressure, but it doesn't do anything, yeah. Right. Mm. It's highly unfortunate. And as we've said, this is there's some interesting stuff and important stuff to do here, and yeah. it's not going to get done. And the only people who actually have access to, the, to these data are the uh, probably a few hundred people who've um, either done the work or handled the paper through the peer review and publication process, um, yeah. and anybody who decides to break in and grab the data from them. So actually, uh, there were yeah. some numbers. We we talked about this last night. So that this da- these data were presented at a meeting in Malta. There were eight hundred people in the audience. Okay, mm-hmm. and and then a few hundred people more have seen it um, through the review process and so forth. So the estimate is anywhere from two hundred fifty to a thousand people have the data. None of whom have security clearances. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So if, if you are a terrorist and you want this information, you will have no trouble at all figuring out uh, which door to kick down to get it. Although this is not going to help any terrorist. Yeah. You know, and the thing that, ke- that I, ke- I can't get my brain around, it just keeps getting me, is the fact that these people who are exclaiming in fear and articulating their fear, uh, what are we going to, you know, what I would say to them is, the only way we can sort of assuage those fears realistically is to do the research. Because what happens uh, if H5N1 does reach the point where it's transmissible between <laughs> but people? But of course. And then we have no idea what to do because we don't know anything about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the here I can tell you what the 
discussion on that was last night. They said this research is not going to help us uh, understand transmission in people. If you're telling us that this virus is, probably won't transmit in people, then there's no use doing it. And it's not going to teach us anything. And that, you know, to which I argue that you never know where this is heading and you have to just mm-hmm. do it. But uh, hmm. if you can't point – so Osterholm said you, the, the cost-benefit analysis – favors not doing this. And I said, you can't do a cost benefit because you just don't know where it's heading. But right. they don't You so they, they don't right. like that. And, and I, I don't mean to disparage you, Michael, but epidemiologists like like uh, Osterholm, and he's a policy guy too. He's an epi, he's an epi guy? Yeah. yeah he's an, and oh, he man. wants cost benefit. And if I say we don't know the benefit, he'll say, ah, typical scientist, you know. And we don't know the cost. <laughs> <laughs> we suspect it's a lot cheaper than they're saying. Though. I mean, I think we should figure out what makes it transmit in ferrets and learn mechanisms. Sure. Yeah. You know, and then extend it, if, then do some kind of study in people to see if the mechanism is the same. And I think it's important to point out this isn't just about H5N1. This is a flu virus mm-hmm. right. that mm-hmm. can uh, apparently periodically jump. Well, we know it can periodically jump to humans. Um, it just can't sustain transmission in us so far. And that's that's an interesting thing to study because new flu viruses coming by the more usual route through something like pigs, that's where we get our seasonal flus and that's where we get our pandemics. That's right. This is this is a fundamental yeah. process we need to understand more about. So understanding t- understanding transmission uh, even in influenza is going to be is going to give you insights into transmission of other uh, yeah. diseases as well. So, it has a broad impact on emerging yeah, uh, emerging sure. infections. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the biggest um, conundrums in virology right now is to understand why we don't understand what happened to the SARS epidemic the following year. Where did why it, it disappeared? Go? Yeah, where did it go? And a but a, where did it come from? B, why was it there? And C, how did it go away? Mm-hmm. And all of those are missing factors. I mean, we don't have any models for any of that stuff. It's bizarre, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, at least we have uh, all of the data that we've collected for uh, West Nile, and we, we know about that, and it's very solid. And you mentioned that you were working on West Nile, and I'm pleased to hear that. I'd, I'd like to have a separate conversation with you sometime about that, Michael. Well, you and, can't. Uh, you have to do it on a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, shucks. Uh, but there's a great example of a, a fatality rate versus a case fatality rate because they did the sort of survey up here in uh, Washington Heights mm-hmm. and in the South Bronx after the epidemic, yeah. and the serological survey indicated there were over 8,000 infections yeah. and only seven deaths. Right. 8,000 right. infections. Mm-hmm. And that's a case fatality rate. of that's, The case fatality rate was pretty low too, but mm-hmm. uh, it was obviously much higher than the fatality rate. Mm-hmm. Actually, as an epidemiologist, uh, Michael's pretty versatile. He can, he can meet you on TWIP. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we're going to have a good time here. <laughs> I want to just read one more quote from the meeting last night before we move on. Uh, this was during the time we were discussing the value or the predictive value. I made the argument that the ferret or any animal experiment doesn't have predictive value for humans, but it teaches you mechanisms, which mm-hmm. is important to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Laurie Garrett said <laughs> – if they do not have predictive value for human beings, then I don't understand why the experiment was done. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Wait a minute. Didn't you hear what I just said? Doesn't she have pet ferrets? Yeah, it's it. So the thing is everyone praises Lori Garrett and she has written some nice books, but she does not – if she doesn't understand why we do animal experiments, then she doesn't understand well, She's the, the one who wrote um, – the coming plague. That's yes. correct. Right? Okay. But yeah, she actually, yeah. I taught a course with Steve Morris for many years here, and she used to be our last uh, speaker, or one of our last speakers. And uh, it was more or less uh, a presentation of how diseases are presented by the press to the public, mm. rather than an actual expose of how diseases spread from person to person. Mm. At the end, we did surveys, two of the students, and almost every year we said, of all the diseases you've just heard about for the last 16 weeks, which one are you afraid of the most? Everybody said flu. Yeah, I know. Everybody. Forget yeah. Ebola, forget rabies, forget SARS. Last, it's flu. Last summer, I, I gave a lecture in a history of science course downtown, and I had a discussion with the students, and they said, what, uh, and what microbe scares you the most? <laughs> I said none of them, and they said, "Really, H five N one doesn't scare you? I said, no. Why would it scare me? So yeah, everyone thinks because the press has hammered it. 
yeah. to them. That's right. You know, we could go on forever, and I think you'll have to come back, Michael, because yes, I have oh, a this feeling, is great. I have I, a feeling know. we haven't scratched the surface of uh, epidemiology, yeah, yeah. but uh, it's a great talk. We have a couple of letters that uh, we'd like to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's do we that. have to get through this first one. <laughs> At least the first one. The first one we've held for a while. Sophie, here you go, Sophie. Dear Twiv Twip Twim hosts, not really sure where this email belongs. I recently started reading a lot more papers than what I'm used to, school-related, and I actually find it quite difficult to use them. Of course, it doesn't help that my that English is my second language, but I can't help thinking that it's more than that. So, how do you make a paper accessible to yourself? I mean, everybody can read a paper, but actually extracting the relevant information seems more like an art than anything else. How do you avoid getting lost in the details or missing them completely? When I read the methods, for example, everything kind of runs together, especially when they repeat the same experiments just with different doses or a slightly different composition of drugs, vet school student. In short, I guess I'm asking, how do you decode a paper to get out the relevant information without getting lost? Thanks again for the great podcast. That's a terrific question. So we can all weigh in on this. I think we should let Michael go first. Sure. Yeah. Well, I I do... uh, a seminar occasionally on uh, critiquing the literature. So I think um, I understand what she's saying about it being an art, but I also think it helps to have a, a systematic approach to, to going through. Uh, and this is what I try to get across to students. In fact, you know what? I can send you my – I have a, a PowerPoint uh, slides that I can actually send you if you want to be post great. it. Yeah. So the first thing that I – make sure to convey when, as you're starting to read through a paper is you're obviously starting with the background and the introduction. You need to be thinking about how well does the the introduction that you're reading synthesize and, and summarize the, the current state of the knowledge, okay, with respect to the research question that this particular group is going to ask, okay? And does, in fact, the description of the background uh, actually identify an area that's lacking, so does the does the background naturally flow into a, the hypothesis? Okay. Then do they state the hypothesis? And, and more than that, do they actually uh, clearly state um, a measurable, testable hypothesis? Okay. If you say you're if you know you're stating the hypothesis at the end of the introduction, and you say um, we sought to evaluate uh, the relationship between um, job-related stress and uh, cardiovascular disease. That is not a measurable, testable hypothesis because you haven't you haven't even defined your exposure or your outcome with that. Okay, so um, I think that's a critical thing to look for: is a clear statement of a measurable and testable hypothesis. Okay, then when you get into the methods, it's going to vary, of course, by field, right? So um, the things that I'm going to look for are going to be different to the things that a molecular biologist uh, are going to look for. But ultimately, what what you want to be described is the study design, okay? What kinds, uh, why did they, the investigators choose uh, the particular methods that they used, and how does this relate back again to the the hypothesis, under, under study, okay? So are they using methods that are appropriate to answer the question, in other words? Um, in epidemiology, one of the, the things that, you know, we need to look for are what are the measures of occurrence? You know, we had this discussion on case fatality. Um, how, how are the investigators defining, okay, what it is they're measuring? And, and what are they using to measure the association between the exposure and the outcome? One thing that I always look for in results are data clearly represented in by the tables and figures, okay? I don't want to read an endless list of their findings. I want all of the salient, I want uh, the key data to be placed well in tables and figures, and then you, in the text, you highlight the salient features, okay? I don't want to read lists and lists and lists in the text of what you um, identified, okay? Um, is there internal... Uh, coherence with the results. So, in other words, do things add up? You got to look at that. You'd be amazed at how often they don't. Okay, people will report things in one table that directly contradict what they're reporting in another table. You know, um, I mean, it's amazing to me how these key features, like 
a research question uh, that's clearly stated is is not often you know well articulated in in a in a in a in a uh, research paper or their description of the methods is completely vague. Okay, and then finally, when it comes to the discussion, um, first of all, do the authors succinctly summarize their findings? Okay, do they it start with that? Um, they should be interpreting each of the major findings that they reported in the results. They should be interpreting uh, point by point in the discussion and then grounding those interpretations in the existing literature. Okay, so I don't want to read, um, you know, just your ph philosophical uh, interpretation of what may be happening. I don't, you know, you can put forth a, uh, an interpretation, but it, it shouldn't just come out of thin air. All right, I want to see that grounded in, in literature. And, you know, how honestly do the investigators discuss their strengths and limitations, okay? Oftentimes they don't. You know, they, they, sometimes they won't even state them explicitly. Um, and then, the, like, the final summary, I think, is did the authors accomplish what they set out to with the study, okay? And do you feel, as a, as a reader, as a, a, uh, an informed critic of the scientific literature that this is an appropriate addition to the scientific literature. Okay, so that's just sort of a summary of the, hmm. uh, the steps that I think can be useful to go through. And, I mean, there, I will send you the slides. There's more specific um, points that, uh, you know, any student can go through and apply. So, yeah. Cool. That's great. That would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, Rich, what do you think? Well, um, I'm going to, uh, I like that as background, and I'm going to assume that uh, I'm a student or anybody uh, approaching a paper that is, is written in a satisfactory fashion relative to all those points, okay? I've still got a problem, <laughs> because i got to read this thing, and it's uh, <laughs> first, first few times around, especially, it's, it's really difficult. Hmm. Um, I would say that, in particular, as a beginning student, uh, almost no matter what you do, it's going to be difficult because uh, it just, you need background, and more than anything else, what you need is practice. Mm. And I think that it's real easy to get frustrated early on and, and you know, say, I just don't get it, and then just don't do a thorough job and kind of kind of leave it. And if you find that it's difficult, don't worry. You're not alone. I think for everybody starting off, this is a, it, it is, in fact, a difficult task. Yeah. And the way to get it is like riding a bicycle or anything else is just to keep at it. And as you acquire more experience with it and as you acquire more uh, background knowledge, it will get easier. Mm. I think that uh, I find that when I read a paper, I actually take advantage of the organization. In, in our field, the, the organization is typically abstract, introduction. Uh, materials and methods in different journals go in different places than its results uh, and discussion. I think, in fact, although as a traditionalist, I objected initially when people started putting materials and methods at the, uh, at the end. end of the yeah. paper. Uh, I, ab I find that, that less and less objectionable because as time has gone, I, uh, another thing I should say is that I think over time with practice, everybody develops their own method at this. Uh, and what I have found is that I pretty much go through the paper from beginning to end. In fact, the organization that we ordinarily use makes pretty much sense. You know, some sort of background uh, uh, information as to why they did the experiment. And then jumping right into the results, if the results are written properly, they have a summary of how they did the experiment. So the methods are implied. And I find that with the methods in the end, uh, as I read through the paper, I'll find that, uh, you know, I don't have enough from the results to understand how they did the experiment. And then I'll use the methods kind of a, as, a, as a reference uh, section to go to the methods and find out uh, what they actually did. I can understand that reading straight through the methods from start to finish, there's going to be a lot of extraneous stuff in there that you don't necessarily uh, detail that you don't necessarily need to understand uh, the experiment. So if methods can be used more as a reference section, at least uh, initially, uh, that's okay. The key to me 
is that it doesn't matter what they say. What matters are the actual data that are in the figures and in the tables. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, the, to me, the focus is on that. You look at a figure, and your job is to understand exactly what the methods were in order to generate the data in that figure. Mm. Then your job is to understand exactly what the data are. You know, we got these black blobs. What are they? They're, they're, is that radioactivity? Is it, you know, is it a Western blot? Uh, what is it? If there's numbers, where did the numbers come from? So understand the data, okay? And then understand the interpretation and then understand the extrapolation from that. And when I read a paper, what I do is I go through and I kind of cruise through the introduction to get an idea and I cruise through the results and I get up, you know, here's our question, here's the experiment that we did and I get up to the point where they're going to describe the results and then I put the text aside. And I get out the figure, and I look at the figure, and I say, do I understand how this was done? If I don't, maybe i got to go to the methods or something like that and figure it out as if I were doing the experiment. I am at the bench. I'm doing the experiment. So I understand it from start to finish. I understand how they got those data. And then I look at those data, and I draw my own conclusion. Mm -hmm. And then I look back at the text, and I see what they concluded. Mm -hmm. All right? And see if they're the same. And then I press on. Um, I do that when I'm reviewing a paper in particular. I, this is what I teach the students. If I'm reviewing a paper, I do the same process. Read the methods up until the point where they're going to uh, make a conclusion, then study the data and the figure, draw my own conclusion, compare it to what they said. If it's the same, the paper gets accepted. If it's different, it gets rejected. Okay? Um, and that, to me, is what actually makes it fun because I want to participate in the process. Okay, And so that way I get to do the experiment and I'm really engaged and I'm asking myself my own questions about how it was done and all that kind of stuff, not just reading what they said. Uh, and then you can compare your process with their process and then move on to the next thing. So that's what's key to me is the data is what drives it, the data are what drive it, and so you have to understand how the experiment was done and, and provide your own interpretation for the data. Alan. Okay. Excellent, excellent descriptions, both of you. Um, so what I can add to this is the, the perspective of a mediocre student. Um, so <laughs> when, when I got to graduate school, I felt like a total idiot because I you know, I'd read papers as an undergraduate, and then all of a sudden I had to read bunches and bunches of papers. And I just, a lot of the time I would sit down and I'd look at these things, and I wouldn't get it. And the first thing to realize <laughs> is it's not because you're stupid. In my case, that may have been that may have been going on, but in, in most cases, this is, it's not hard because you're stupid. It's hard because it's hard. Yeah. Um, there is a scientific paper is not a magazine article. It's not like any other kind of reading you've ever. It's not even like a textbook. Um, it is a means of compressing an enormous amount of information into a very small space to transmit it over distance. And so the, the first thing you have to understand is that you're not there to read the paper so much as unpack it into your mind. Um, so what I, what I do is um, I, I sit down with a paper. I've, I've evolved this process to the point where I, I read the abstract just to kind of skim quick quickly through it. Um, you're not really going to get everything that's going on in the abstract because that's taking the compressed information and compressing it even more. Um, but then dig into the introduction. And in a, in a well-written or even reasonably well-written paper, the introduction will start off with stuff that you probably either already know or can look up pretty easily and figure out and it'll funnel down toward this is why we're doing this particular research and that sets the groundwork for the whole rest of the paper hopefully but understand that there are an awful lot of scientific papers that are very poorly written mm. um, 
there. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not because the science is necessarily bad. You can see these in great journals. It's just that they had to compress too much information or uh, they were in a hurry to write it because they were going to get scooped. And for whatever reason, the, the writing just may not be all that great. Um, but wade through the introduction before you get on to the rest of the paper and figure out what the context of all of this is. Um, and then I, w I kind of follow the pattern that Rich described, although I'm actually, uh, again, it's the bad student syndrome, I'm likely to skip to the discussion and give it a quick read through to see where they're going with all this. And the introduction and the discussion are the bookends of the whole thing. The introduction sets the scene and, and concludes with the hypothesis, or as we used to call it, the my research to the rescue line. You know, this, this is a problem for this reason, and now our research to the rescue. We're going we're gonna to explore this <laughs> hypothesis. Um, and then in the discussion, you should see where they're really headed with this. And there's going to be, you know, discussion of uh, sort of a, a bullet type summary of the major conclusions. And then and then here's what we further hypothesize from it. Um, but from there, I will frequently go to the figures and tables before before even really getting into the results section. Um, I find the results section is often not terribly useful to me, uh, but the figures and tables are the data. As, as Rich said, that's the real science in the thing. And the thing to understand about figures and tables in a scientific paper is they are not like figures and tables in a PowerPoint presentation, even at a meeting. Uh, sometimes they are, but usually in a PowerPoint, people will separate out the experiments a little bit more. Again, in the paper, it's all compressed together. And so you've got you know, one one figure that has six panels, and each of those panels represents um, a, f a few different experiments and controls that are all fitting together into this thing, don't expect to glance at it and figure it out in, in 60 seconds. When you, when you look at a figure, you're, you set aside a little time. It could take 15, 20, 30 minutes to figure out a figure in a paper if it's a big one. Um, but as Rich said, you know, this is this is what is the real heart of the matter, and I will sit there and I'll wade through. Okay, what are they doing here? Where did where did these samples come from? What did they do to them? And that's when I'll refer to the results and sometimes even to the methods. Although I have to say, I, I seldom find a whole lot of reason to refer to the methods if I'm if I'm in a hurry. Um, but I, you know, figure out what the experiment was and then look at the results and form your own opinion about what those results actually show. Because uh, you're now, when you go back and you actually read the results section, you're going to be told their interpretation of these results, which, as Rich pointed out, you may not want to agree. Um, so that's, that's my general entry into a paper is the introduction to figure out what the heck's supposed to be going on. Um, skim the discussion to see where they're headed with this and then dig into the figures and, and try and grind through those and just kind of, kind of understand that the whole process you're going through is to unpack this information that has been presented in front of you in this very dense format. Mm, thank you. D-cubed. Well, <clears throat> you, don't, the, you don't read papers, Being right? the oldest member of this group... <laughs> I can go back before we had <laughs> when we had repetitive had paper. We had repetitive <laughs> Well, we pounded our own papyrus, and we no. I, I can tell you something that's happened over the last thirty years that uh, a lot of you are also aware of, but uh, because of, of course you have that literature to go back and look at, and that is the um, the quantitative expression of results now has gotten exceptionally uh, sophisticated. There are programs now available on, on your computer for massaging data into visual imagery. And so it depends on the kind of paper uh, as to how easy it is to understand. Okay, so if you look at the ecological literature, for instance, where you've got these global studies of uh, climate change or uh, sea ocean temperature changes or glaciation events that occurred over millions of years or ice core sample data uh, points and uh, oxygen levels indicating whether the earth is getting warmer or cooler uh, that data those data have been expressed in a way that allows your optic lobes maximum opportunity to catch it right away okay those are easy to see things uh, i think even looking at dna chip 
uh, data in which you've got little uh, mountains <laughs> that come up expressing certain levels of expression for certain genes during certain times of a cell cycle, for instance, etc. If you just go, like Rich said, and you look at the results and you can see these things expressed in visual imagery that your brain can interpret, it makes the paper very easy to understand. And then you can go back and fill in all the results and all of the, all the data that are missing in your mind as to how that was done. Uh, I, I start with the abstract. There's no question about this. I want to know if these people think they've made a, a, a contribution that's worth publishing, that's my worth taking the time to understand. And so I'll, I'll see what the big issues were and, and what their conclusion was from their data that they got. But then uh, just, just like uh, Alan said, the introduction is key because you define the problem that exists – you talk about the missing parts, and then you talk about how you filled in the missing parts with some of your own experiments. And then, of course, Rich had uh, – you said it best. You just go to the results and pretend they're yours and envision how you would have done that. And I, I have the most fun doing that too, by the way. It shouldn't. But I, I review different literature than you do, I'm sure, because I mean, I'm looking at uh, – a lot of ecological data, to be honest, uh, right now at least, and uh, to look at the vegetation uh, during certain seasons or during certain uh, disasters, et cetera, et cetera. Those are easier to express in some ways, and I think the ecologists have had an easier time of it because they started out with um, graphs that express quantitation as well as qualitation. And so you could watch the uh, parameters change over time in a single graph that was that was absolutely beautifully expressed. And uh, I'm talking about energy flow diagrams and things of this sort. But but when you've got you know experiment after experiment after experiment, and I, I varied this and I varied this by quantitation, and then I went into the next one and I varied that, and you've got these big thick six or seven or ten you know uh, paneled um, expressions of the same thing over time. And your your eye has to make a movie out of it almost, and start at the top and work at the bottom and see what what the event was that you're even trying to describe. It's harder to place yourself into those experiments when you're just starting out. And this is a person who's just starting out, so it's, yes. they haven't done the work yet. So how would they be able to do a rich condit approach? Uh, they would do an Allen approach first, and I'm so stupid, I don't even know where to look first. But as time goes on. And your own data start to come out and you're starting to express them yourselves to get your first publication out of the way, for instance. Then you start to see, oh, there's some logic to all of this. And I, I, I will begin with the the simple experiments that are easy to explain and I'll work my way down into the parts that I don't have a clue as to what I just did. But it did show something. And maybe I'll reserve that for another paper. And that's how you start sorting this data out. Remember this, that research is an ongoing process, Right. That's what we just devoted this whole um, discussion to today. And it's not a story that's self-contained, although you try to write it as if it is. So you write, I did A, and then finding A, I got B, and finding B, I got C, and finding C, I got D. and find That is not how research goes. I found A, and therefore I went to F. Now, if F didn't work, I'm going to go back to E. And if E didn't work, I'm going to go, I'm going to try to save some steps on this thing. And some then you people, go WTF. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> Or even worse, I can spell out a lot of other things here, guys, which I'm not going to do. But the point is we know to go from A to B. We go to A to Z if we could. And then Z starts another A. And then that's how you do research. But when you write it up, you write it up as though you do A, B, C, D, E. It doesn't make any sense when you read it. It makes sense when you talk to a scientist and how they, they conduct laboratory research. So the more experience – uh, I'm sorry, I blocked on the name of the letter writer, Sophia. Sophie. Sophie. Sophia. Okay, Sophie. The more research you do, the more you will see the logic system that human brains apply to the expression of stories. You're going to tell us a story, and the story will be self-contained. It won't be complete, but it will be self-contained. It's it's enough of the larger picture to write a small uh, short story of a novel that could be your whole life, your novel is what you do at the end of your career, not, at, not in the beginning. So you're writing chapters to this novel. If you're lucky enough to work on the same thing, unless they tell you not to work on H5N1, uh, you can write this novel for yourself by the time you get to be 30 years down the road in the lab. So I, that's how I look at these things. And you, know, you review grants the same way, of course, uh, only on a different scale. But uh, you're still looking for the story. What is that story? 
and how did, they, how did they tell it? And did they tell it in a way that made it clear? Because if they don't, either the paper doesn't get published or you don't get your grant. So it forces you to express yourself clearly eventually. All right. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. I don't read papers, so I have nothing to add. <laughs> He doesn't on, read them. He writes them. <laughs> I remember when I was a graduate student, there was a really smart professor in the department. He used to go get his mail at the department <laughs> office. He would get his nature. And by the time he reached his office, he would have read an, read an article and understand it. And he'd come in the lab and tell me all about it. Wow. And this freaked me out. Said, How does this guy in two minutes <laughs> understand this? Right. And the key is what Rich said and everybody else. You'll uh, get, you'll get used right. to it. You you'll will. develop your own way of doing it. That's right. And now... I can do that, although we don't pick up journals in the office anymore. <laughs> I can do it. My, my, what I do is I read the abstract because I think it yeah. summarizes the whole paper. It tells me what to expect. The intro is really important because, mm-hmm. as uh, Michael said, it frames what they're going to do. I skip the methods and because yeah. I, these days I pretty much know how all this works. Sophie, you may want to go and do it, read them, but I do it at the end of the paper because mm-hmm. I think it's just going to interfere at the beginning. And then I tend to focus on the figures too. I don't really read that much unless I need to. And I'd like to see if I can figure out what their conclusions are ahead of time. Um, and then I, uh, depending on the journal, they, so the Journal of Virology, which I read a lot, in the results section they have subheadings. So I'm looking at one here. MIR-122 enhances production of infectious virus through interactions with RNA. So it summarizes the findings in that in that paragraph. And then at the end of each of these sections, if they're written well, these results indicate that. It summarizes all the results. So I, fu- I kind of go to the heading in the last sentence to summarize. I look at the figures and I go through the, the results very quickly. That's what I do for TWIV often. Um, and then the discussion I will read if I find that there are some unanswered questions like what did this result mean? Um, where is it going? And so forth. But that I... I don't always read the whole thing because I've got the figures and I know what it means to me. Those are just some things that I do. Uh, and then other journals like Science, they don't make subheadings, so you can't do that. But um, I think you got a lot of suggestions. Uh, I have one more comment on this, and that is that um, I, one of the things I do here is I talk to the students on how to give a talk. And I've talked to this, uh, I've talked about you know, how I take apart a figure in terms of the methods and the data and the interpretation uh, uh, and then the conclusions from that. Uh, give it, For me, giving a talk should be the same process. Uh, and that is what I like. The talks that I like the best and the talks that I like to give are where the focus is really on the data. And when somebody shows a slide with data on it, they take the time to tell me what the experiment was and uh, how it was done and what the data are and the conclusion and actually point out the different parts of the figure, use all the elements, uh, uh, describe all the elements so that I have time to assimilate it so that, once again, I can participate in the process. And it, uh, it, it, that does not seem to be the trend. That's how I was taught, or at least that was the, those were my role models. Now there's a, a great tendency to take, you know, Alan's eight-panel figure and throw it up and not even describe the experiment, just say what the conclusion is and then move on. And I'm not getting anything out of that. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. All right, let's do one more because it's short and it's interesting, relevant, from Joanna. She writes, greetings. Oh, sorry, D- Dixon, Sophie had a PS for Dixon. I just started my parasitology course, and I must admit, I never really appreciated the intricacies of protozoa. I mean, they're amazing. I'm going all squee when reading about them. I can't comprehend how a single cell can have a mouth and everything. I think I might just (laughs) find out what I want to do my bachelor's project on. Final project you do at the end of your undergrad. There you go, Dixon. All right, Joanna writes, Greetings, I have a question regarding the influenza type A H5N1 virus. Why is its genome purely avian? Why isn't it like some other flu virus genomes, which are partly human in nature and partly avian? The answer will be really helpful to me. Thank you very much. And Joanna's in the Philippines. Right. 
Well, I think the influenza viruses started in birds. Mm-hmm. Right. And they go to other species and they reassort. Mm-hmm. And, pigs. Uh, pigs, humans. Um, this doesn't go to too many other species. So, yeah, the pig got it from birds. The, yeah, the, the, pig's, the pig is the vessel, right? That's it. Yeah. So Mixing they say. Vessel. So the H5N1 hasn't reassorted yet. Sorry. Right? Um, that's an interesting question, actually. Why is it hasn't done that, or we haven't detected it? It's maybe another good reason for not. Being Somebody should passage it in a susceptible, potentially susceptible uh, model system. <laughs> I mean, they might see be able see if to, they can adapt it. They might pigs. be able to ferret this thing out if they put it in pigs. Really now, pigs have a lot of uh, different virus, flu That's viruses right. in them. You could put it in pigs and see if it reassorts. I heard last night that um, in some countries, not Egypt, apparently they are looking for H five N ones in pigs just to make sure they're not going in there, you know, and picking right. up mm. human genes, right, but. Right. But this notion, this notion, is, this is a uh, uh, an interesting question. When you say that vi- flu virus genomes, which are partly human, that is, flu. Uh, human human vi- human influenza virus sequences, right. as yeah. you point out, Vincent, the ultimate reservoir for all of these is is birds. Right. Yep. And the things we think of as humans are uh, human. Uh, sequences are things that were probably originally avian viruses sure. that have become adapted That's right. uh, uh, t- to humans. Incidental so, hosts. Uh, you know, in some ways, <laughs> they're all avian. In some ways, there's no such thing as a human. This is an adaptation to humans. Sure. Call it humanized. Right? And the, the yeah, uh, yeah. H5N1 simply uh, has not uh, done that yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Act, you know, it's there are what, like, uh, how many different serotypes in birds are there now? Like fifteen or more? Sixteen, yeah. all of them. They're all in birds. Right. Every right. one, every HA and NA is present in birds. Exactly. Right. And only, and we're talking about millennia here, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And only three of those serotypes over all of that time. Have actually become adapted to humans. Just blame it on the dinosaurs. H one, H two, H three, and uh, what? There's three different neuraminidases or something. Yeah. Um, Does that mean, Rich, that it will never an H five will never go into people? No, it could. Okay, H six could go into people. You know what's H- another eighteen? H fifteen could go into people. <laughs> yeah, and it's important. It's important to note H five N one didn't just appear uh, where whatever the first case to come in it's was. Been around a while. Um, the, this is a virus that's been in the birds and probably been infecting the humans for a very long time. And not only that, but when we talk about H five N one, we're only talking about the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. There's seven or eight other. Mm. Uh, uh, I mean, sorry. Sorry, six six other segments, um, you know, and these things have an opportunity to exchange with each other. There's lots of possibilities out there. Another interesting step there is the waterfowl to domesticated bird. Um, is it's predominantly a mm-hmm. uh, avian virus, but it's actually predominant. It, I mean, originally waterfowl uh, are are the uh, ultimate natural reservoir, and those birds, those waterfowl that were able to maintain consistent, uh, either through migratory patterns or, or whatever, consistent contact with, um, or periodic throughout the year, contact with domesticated birds, um, you know, that is a key step in being able to get the virus into, uh, in humans, ultimately, mm-hmm. downstream. All right, let's do a couple of picks of the week. And uh, Michael, let's start with you. So I, you know, I, I almost picked the uh, rabies survivor. That's cool. It was, I was, was just amazing, that too. Yeah. amazing story. Um, but I thought I would pick something that was uh, more relevant to uh, what we talked about today: epidemiology. So I found just a, a few weeks ago, I came across this app, uh, smartphone app, and it's called. Love my epi, <laughs> and what it is is uh, it's basically a little piece of software that you can. And unfortunately, this is uh, I, well, I don't know actually if it's I'm available search- on I'm iPhone. Searching as we talk. It's on Android Market, so it's it's an Android app, but it may also be on iPhone. And if there's not one, there's probably some analog on iPhone that's available. But basically, this is a little piece of software that allows you to calculate on the fly 
many of the different metrics that we use in epidemiology uh, for to identify associate well to identify descriptives like prevalence and incidence and things like that, but also uh, metrics that we use to identify associations like odds ratios and relative risks and and the the reason I I like this a lot is that it's a good uh, tool for students because there it gives you quite a lot of uh, information and and statistics when you enter in uh, your data into the two by two table and it's all based on two by two tables so breaking down the experience into exposed and unexposed versus diseased and not diseased okay and it gives you quite a lot of statistics when you plug these numbers in and if you don't know what they are it actually you can uh, finger over the the different statistics and a, a bubble will pop up and explain uh, what these statistics are and when it's appropriate and under what types of uh, study scenarios the particular statistic is appropriate. So it's sort of, it's not just a tool for epidemiologists to use on the fly. Um, it's also a good tool for students because then they can uh, uh, get some some educational content uh, in addition to just the you know purely utilitarian uh, app. Cool. So, nice. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, our first Android-only app, I think, because it's not on the iPhone. I checked. Dixon, do you have a pick, or are you bowing out today? No, no, no. I have a pick. Mm -hmm. It's a little uh, tangential to virology. This is more of a bacterial. Uh, oh, pick. you're never tangential, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat, somewhat. Anyway, I picked this one out of uh, the science and technology section of uh, CN uh, Chemical and Engineering News. Uh, and it, it just, uh, it's something that probably you're familiar with because it's been in other places too, talked about. But it's the use of bacteria as an array on a plate that's um, used to detect the presence or absence of things. And in this case, they were using a bacterial array to detect arsenic in water. And when mm. the arsenic is present, the bacteria actually line up and they vibrate. <laughs> so as you put the drops of uh, solution onto these various uh, sections of this array, uh, wherever you have something that these bacteria are attuned to that you want to detect, they will line up and start to vibrate and a little electrical signal will be given off and it will direct you to that particular well and it says, oh, that was the one that had arsenic in it. And that's pretty cool stuff. Because this is like a field test that uh, goes – it's very, 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 very sensitive. Nice. It's incredibly sensitive. So that's my pick of the week. All right. I'm sure they'll Chemical do this. and engineering news. Yes, page 38, uh, January sixteenth, two 2012. All right. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. There was a reporter from that – <laughs> journal at the event last night. Yeah, that's uh, it's I actually it's pretty good. I have lots of news. Alan, what do you have? Uh I have a pick that is uh it's not from the hard sciences, it's from the soft sciences, but I've <laughs> actually found it really interesting. It's a blog called Environmental Economics. Um and this is run by two professors of economics. Uh one is at uh, the Ohio State University and the other is at Appalachian State. Um, I gather they were colleagues in graduate school. Uh, one of them, the Ohio State guy, was actually a friend of mine in high school. That's how I originally oh, came yeah. across this. Um, <clears throat> but they, uh, it's, it's kind of a, an economics blog version of TWIV. Um, they, they have some running jokes that they do, but mostly they just post up short pieces um, commenting on uh, either – either general economics or they'll take some phenomenon and uh, and discuss uh, its economic or environmental impact um, in ter in economic terms and environmental economics is this whole study of uh, of you know how do you figure out uh, the value of preserving nature because right. if we don't figure out the economic value of it then sure. it's not actually going to happen um, so that's uh, <laughs> it's I, I've kind of gotten a a secondary. I took an economics course in college, but forgot most of it, and, I, and I've gotten this whole secondary education of, of economics and just reading this blog for a couple of years. Um, so it's a, it's a fun one to follow. <laughs> There's an article cool. here. A SoCal woman says the energy-efficient window installed in a neighbor's condominium is melting the plastic components on cars parked in her carport. 
<laughs> right. A, there's a cause and effect study that needs to be done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm positive that the window is what's causing damage to my car. Of course That's it what is. they say about vaccines. I'm positive. Oh, vaccines. yes. Oh, yes. Oh, man, don't get me started. <laughs> Which leads us to Rich. So uh, Alan gets credit for this. He gave me this pick, and he didn't even know it. This was in uh, in some uh, – he pointed this out to me in some correspondence uh, that we had uh, during the week. Uh, I just want to point out a wiki article on the Dunning-Kruger effect. I've been aware of this for some time, but I didn't know it had a name, and I didn't have any specific reference to it. And this isn't actually the original literature. It's just a, the wiki entry, but it's a, a very interesting phenomenon. This refers to a, 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 a psychology study, and I'll just read it. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect is a cognitive bias in which the unskilled suffer from illusory superiority, mistakenly <laughs> rating their ability much higher than average, while the highly skilled underrate their own abilities. Okay? So this is a tendency. These guys did some experiments to come up with this. This is a tendency for people who are uh, unskilled uh, unskilled to overrate their skills and people who are skilled to underrate their skills. The way they, my understanding is the way they did this was they gave people some kind of a test and then they asked them how, before they showed them the results, they asked them how they thought they did on the test and then showed them the results and then asked for more comment. And basically, people who did poorly on the test asked how they did usually overrated how they thought they did. And then when they saw how they really did, they made excuses. <laughs> and people who, people who did well usually thought before they were shown the results that they probably didn't do all that well. And then when they were shown the, the results, they said, oh, I could have done better. Hmm. I think, in fact, I was thinking about this. I think, in fact, it's probably the other way around. I think people who overrate their abilities wind up being unskilled. And the other way around. Uh-huh. I think it's a personality thing. And I, I see that this is so important to me in teaching. I see this all the time. The people who are the hardest to teach are the people who think they already know it yeah, because yeah. they don't ask the questions. Right. They, never, they never question uh, whether or not they know it. They figure they know it. And if they got it wrong, it doesn't make any difference, okay, because they, don't, they, they figure they got it right. It's the people who are constantly uncertain, unsure of themselves, who think they might have it wrong, that actually ask the questions and get somewhere. So I think this is a really interesting phenomenon. And while Dunning and Kruger get the credit for doing the the first hard research on it, it's a phenomenon that's been noted for a long time. Um, In fact, I I have in my email signature a quote from Charles Darwin, Mm. uh, which is, (laughs) ignorance sooner begets confidence than does knowledge. Right. <laughs> which is the, the summarizing the same effect, but not quantifying it. And actually, in this uh, wiki article, they they quote Bertrand Russell as well. Says one of the painful things about our time is that those who feel certainty are stupid, and those with any imagination and understanding are filled with doubt and indecision. <laughs> same thing, huh. Alan. You have, you have used this to describe. A variety of of, of silliness having to do with uh, (laughs) virology, right? Yes. Yeah, but it applies to, like, everything, including politics. And Rich just had an interesting election that happened in his state that Mm. I would venture to guess that the winner would have fallen into one category and the loser would have fallen into the other category. And you can decide. Uh, We don't do politics here. No, we didn't. I I stayed away from the names on that one. (laughs) But I think you (laughs) might. Might be able to guess who that is. Gonna get emailed, Dixon. <laughs> that was poorly anonymized data. Let them write. <laughs> okay, my pick is an op-ed from the Times uh, just yesterday by Howard Markle, who is a professor of the history of medicine at the University of Michigan. He's also the author of When Germs Travel, Six Major Epidemics That Have Invaded America Since 1900 and Fears They Have Unleashed. Hmm. But the op-ed is called Don't Censor Influenza Research, a really nice, uh, thoughtful essay on why this research should not be censored. And I'm really happy. This is really the one I wanted to write (laughs) but have been putting it off for a while. So thank you, Howard. And I'm happy to see someone outside the field uh, agree that this science should go forward. 
as time goes on, I think we'll see more and more people weigh in on this. I, I, at least I hope so. I hope so. I think okay. a lot of people have to. We can't be quiet yeah, I think that's about right. this. And that will do it. Oh, we do have a uh, listener pick of the week. Simon writes, I recently finished reading this fascinating book on the Black Death caused by the parasite Yersinia pestis, which was carried by the Oriental rat flea throughout Europe during the 14th century. And I thought it would be great to recommend the book to those interested in infectious diseases. No, none of us are interested in, in that, right? <laughs> the Great Mortality, written by John Kelly, is a fascinating tale concerning the rise and fall of plague throughout Europe. John Kelly takes the reader through every, each country of Europe, describing in great detail the horrors of the arrival of a new disease to a continent where little immunity met. Two-thirds of the European population perished. The book begins with the arrival of the disease through the ports of Italy, with particular attention giving, given to Genoa. It then details the advancement of the pestilence, giving an idea of the epidemiological considerations for a new pandemic. A discussion of recent scholarship on both the origin and the nature of the plague is also included. Thank you, Simon. When I uh, retire, I'm going to go to the TWIV book list on Amazon.com and read the whole thing. <laughs> cool. <Yeah. laughs> it's a great list. It is a it great is. list. It's amazing. Yeah, fantastic. I tell you, it's yeah. quite long right now. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good idea. It should, hopefully, it will stay on the web long enough. I don't. I won't be able to finish it for um, dust. Dust. <laughs> dust. That'll do it. Sorry, it's a long twiv, but we figure you listen to what you uh, you can. That's right. You can fast forward. Suck it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Listen, it'll be all right. Get used to it. Through it. It'll be all right. That sounds like it's better than reading research papers. <laughs> PI advice. Twiv is on iTunes, at the Zoom Marketplace, and at microbeworld.org. Check out our app at microbeworld.org. Send your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Michael Walsh is not only at SUNY Downstate Medical Center, he also blogs at infectionlandscapes.org and has a podcast, Germlines. You can find that at germlines.org. Germlines. Good one. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Thank you. You guys, you know, it, this is fantastic. I, <laughs> you guys provide such a fantastic service. Uh, I'm thrilled to, to be a part of it today. Yeah. Well, feelings, come back. We, we enjoyed mutual. it. Absolutely. Feelings mutual. Absolutely. Dixon Despommier, also known as D-Cubed, and he hates it. That's why I tell him every week. <laughs> I don't mind it so much. Where can people find you, Dixon? Uh, Trichinella.org, uh, MedicalEcology.org, or VerticalFarm.com. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And for dispensing wisdom as usual. My pleasure. Alan Dove, thank you for joining us. Where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at alandove.com. And uh, I'm also on Twitter where I, uh, I dispense snide comments and irrelevant links. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Alan. Highly entertaining, I might add. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's what Twitter's for, I understand. So. <laughs> Rich Condit, thank you. Quite welcome. I love it every I, time. I think you can't be found, can you? No. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm a- absolutely invisible. I'm just sitting here <laughs> in Twiff Studio South in Gainesville, Florida, in my dis- just delightful office looking at this brilliant sculpture on the building across the street from me. It's great. Sounds like a good life. Yeah, it's not bad. Thanks a lot, Rich. Sure. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and uh, I can be found at virology.ws. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.